Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast. Hello to any of our new listeners. Hello to lots of our old listeners. It's We're coming close to the end of the year now, would you believe? 2019 it? is almost a wrap. It is. So we have three more podcasts to go out this year, yeah. including this one. Uh, and this podcast is going to be with a previous guest that we've had on, Corin Smith. Twice before, I think. Uh, at least once. Yeah, it was an twice, I think. epic podcast that we had with him focused around salmon farming, uh, as you were here at the start of this, exactly a year ago, so it turns out. Uh, and once again, we're going to be talking about salmon farming because a lot has changed and happened over the and last he's changed months. his role of what he's doing. He's uh, Yeah, he's basically barely done any guiding this year. He's been mainly focused on salmon farming and Atlantic salmon conservation. So we're going to touch on uh, recreational fishing and that role in conservation, the salmon farming industry in Scotland, but as well as the rest of the world. Uh, His involvement with Patagonia, touring the film artificial around film festivals all across Europe, really interesting discussions that he had there. Um, and the relevance of fishing in the modern world as, as a recreational pastime, uh, to name just a few things. I mean, this is this is we're going to try and keep this intro fairly short because the hour the podcast is an hour and forty five minutes long. We just I don't know where the time went. Uh, so I met Corin at his house just a few days ago, actually, uh, and we recorded the show. It was a great discussion. Lots been going on in the the world of uh, conservation and uh, hunting uh, from the UK and. Africa, I would say. Yeah, so as many of our listeners are probably aware, well, certainly those in the UK, although this seems to be news that has spread around the world, is that there is currently a consultation open to ban the import of um, trophies, so animal products that would be considered trophies, into the UK. And as it's transpired now, the now that it's It'd be the open export for, of trophies from the UK out with is that correct? Well, so potentially the, the, originally the discussion was just the import of trophies, yes. but now that it's sort of filtered through the woodwork, there's a couple of options that are being consulted on, and the most restrictive of which is an outright ban, which would also mean a ban on the export of anything. So most people will know in Scotland, a lot of red deer are hunted throughout the year. And a lot of those um, heads are exported to America and Europe because a lot of the the guests that come here are from those parts of the world. Yeah, are are not from from Scotland or England. So that would potentially mean that those people wouldn't come, maybe, if they couldn't export. So this is up for consultation. The end date on it is the 25th of January. So if you want to have your say about you know, the importance of this trade, you need to get your responses into DEFRA by the 25th of January, 2020. Simply Google DEFRA trophy hunting. It is the first thing that comes up. I just did it before. So this has come about from everything that I've read. This has come about from from Africa. The, the, the whole reason why this is in up in the air is due to trophy hunting in Africa. Well, that's what it was. It was raised by Zach Goldsmith, yes. who's a member of parliament, uh, who has for years had a very strong animal rights agenda. Uh, He said two years ago when he was interviewed, I'm not sure exactly what the event was, that he was going to do this. So this shouldn't be news to anybody. And yet suddenly, I mean, it's news because it's now being enacted now that there's a consultation process. But But it shouldn't be news. There's there's been two years of... He mentioned he was going to do it years ago. And and yet, once again, we seem to have been you know, caught unaware, like like this, but, is, this is something that we were surprised what, by. <laughs> what I find funny is time and time and time again, and we've mentioned this probably if you go back four years, we were talking about this, is that organizations within the UK and people largely within the UK just d- ignore what's happening abroad. It's not our problem. Oh, what, what's happening in Africa, it's not, it doesn't affect us. What's happening in America it doesn't affect us. But guess what? Now something that has an animal rights agenda that is it was mainly focused on sort of lions and elephants. Yes, that correct. was the driving force behind it. Yeah. Potentially could now affect something in the UK. Yeah, two different continents. Yeah, no, I mean you're right. We, it's something we've always said. We need to pay more attention to what's happening on a global and now it's platform. Knock, now it's knocking on the door. Hello, hello. It is, uh, and, and as we sit and record this, uh, none of our uh, hunting organisations in the UK have really had um, any public, public uh, stance on it. 
you know, there's been no real public statement as to what their position is. I, it's I, been I reckon, really poor. I reckon the statement for all of them is, is we're working hard behind the scenes. That is exactly what the statement has been. We're working hard behind the scenes, and guess what? Guess guess what? And and the the time the chickens have come home to roost. It is not. I, I, don't get me wrong. I think that the organisations. I'm talking about all of them broadly in the UK specifically are probably doing really good things behind the scenes. But actually, we're in the the time, the age, where nobody actually gives a shit what you're doing behind the scenes. You need to be seen in front, and it's a public war that's going on. Well, that, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right, because yeah. whatever is happening uh, behind closed doors, and I know that there is stuff. There is stuff happening, you can't deny that. But whatever is happening there, it doesn't change the fact that this has now been in the news for weeks. And so the public, the, the damage to public perception has already been done. Yeah. And there, no one has tried to right that damage and, and talk about the good work that is done through conservation, through this activity of, of hunting and uh, and hunting abroad and in this country. I mean, no one's even started to really talk about it. I mean, we've seen a couple of magazines mention it, but I haven't really, I haven't seen much from the, from the organizations regard to how this might affect our country. Uh, and, you know, we really need to get on this. So we're going to try and cover this on the podcast fairly soon. Um, the, Dr. Adam Hart is someone who I'm going to try and get on. He did a brilliant um, interview on the Lush podcast, not a podcast I would try and encourage anybody <laughs> to listen to because it's largely full L- of garbage. Um, uh, but his interview on there was exceptionally good. For people that don't know Lush, Lush is a cosmetic beauty company. Co- cosmetic uh, company within the UK who have a really strong animal rights ties to um, hunt saboteurs. and uh, It's very, like a, at the extreme end very of animal extreme rights. End, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we we're, we will tackle it. Uh, and in fact, I wrote an article about this this very thing in Sporting Rifle, which is out this month. Uh, it's already in print, so you can go and pick up a copy and you can see what I had to say. I, I should point out, I said we were going to k- keep this short, um, but well, there's a, should, there's a few uh, things it, to it is cover. important. Uh, one of the things I did write at the end of that article was that it's important to realize that even if this is enacted, it is not saying that we can no longer go and hunt in those countries. No. It is no longer saying that foreign hunters can't come here and stalk red deer. It just means that you can't export that, in inverted commas, trophy. You know, whatever that item is that you want to take, whether it be a skin or or antlers or, you know, horns or whatever. And I would say that uh, that is not an ideal situation because it's very wasteful. You know, if you go, these animals need hunted anyway, especially when you're looking at you know, red deer management, which we've talked about plenty of times before on the podcast. These it's, it's, animals it's, are it's, going to be hunted. It's, it's, it's part of population it's, control. It, and it's part of government policy to keep the numbers down. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, no more pertinent than in Scotland. But if you can't import that and take it home, we still need to do it. We still, yes. if we really believe everything we're saying about hunting being a form of conservation management, whether we can take the the antlers home and some or some memento of that animal, we should still go out and do that hunting. And sadly, I think there are probably quite a lot of people who, if that barrier was in their way, they would no longer do it. And I think that says more about hunters than anything else. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's <laughs> not to say that I, uh, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing with them wanting to ban it. I think the premise and the reasons why are, are very misguided. They seem to assume that by banning that, that they're going to, uh, banning this import of trophies products is somehow going to save animals in Africa, which is a complete misnomer. <laughs> and the science proves that to be wrong. I, I don't think anyone that's actually looked at the policies actually spent any time on the ground in Africa. <laughs> I, don't because, think, I don't think they have. Uh, and like you said, these, these animals have to be hunted. When, when I was in Tanzania, you look at the animals and it's very, very closely managed. And you know they are looking at species, they're managing, and the population's as far, much as people can't believe it, the populations are actually growing because they're being hunted. I, well, in the in the areas, in the where areas that I was in, particularly giraffe, in one area. I mean, I've never seen so many giraffe in my life, and in such a concentrated area. And before uh, the the outfitter that I was with took over, and this particular area was nine hundred thousand acres. Uh, before they took over, there was almost no giraffe there. And that was just a concentrated effort on giraffe. And if you look at the animals as well and the local population, uh, I went to a school and the school relies on uh, donations from uh, the hunting, the hunters that come for food, be it food that has been hunted or donations in uh, grains. To buy like staples. To, yeah, yeah, to buy staples. And when we arrived at one school, they hadn't had food since February this year. 
and the kids that's where they get their lunch they're not getting lunch at home so if the food doesn't ha- the school doesn't have any food the kids don't eat lunch and also the other thing you got to think about is that they can keep more children in school if they can feed them yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a whole series of knock on effects that are just simply not considered. Yeah, and it, it's we've very, we touch on this uh, in this podcast when we're talking about fish. We very often only focus on the environment and the animals, but that has to be in conjunction with the people. Hundred percent in the in the in the area and the land and the environment that they all exist in together. Because unless you're concerned about that at the same time, you're on a hiding to nothing. Incidentally, the same school that. Where I went to had 400 children. Wow, it was that big. Yeah, it had probably, I would say, eight classrooms, eight to nine classrooms. And that was built 25 to 30 years ago, donated by two people, a hunter and the outfitter that took the hunter. There. Really? <laughs> yeah, two people. Amazing. That was it. And that, that's going to make a big difference on the ground. Yeah. So, yeah, we will dig into this uh, much more going forward. Uh, you know, in the next few weeks, hopefully, and certainly before the 25th of January when this uh, consultation process will be finished in the UK. We have a winner from the competition two weeks ago, which was to win uh, a copy of Modern Huntsman Volume 3, all on land management. We played you a sound. Well, it was more than just a sound. It was a lot of sounds. Geese. <laughs> yeah. it, geese? It, it was. It was. It was a yeah. flock of geese uh, taking off, and there were pinkfoot geese. So we had. There, there was. Of, a, there was actually a lot of correct answers. There was there, deeing the correct uh, goose. There was. <laughs> there, there was a lot of wrong as well. Yeah. There was a lot of people that just said geese. Um, we had a s- snow goose. We probably would have taken geese if no one else had got the exact. Yeah, correct I would have answer. taken geese if there'd been none. But anyway, there was quite a few people who who knew that they were pinkfoot. So I'm very impressed. Uh, so the winner is Alan Johnson, who incidentally entered via email and in the same email because we asked this question because it was our four-year birthday or we missed our four-year birthday two weeks ago uh, he's been a podcast listener from the start and he even sent it, a little yeah, picture. We, we've met alan a few times we have met alan yeah, yeah it shows uh he even sent a little picture of a spider co knife that we gave away on the, the first away. year yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah which he still has so i still have one of those spider co knives so in my kitchen and i use it for cutting opening boxes, opening boxes. yep so congratulations, Alan. Uh, contact us. You know how because you sent us an email. And we will get out Volume 3 Modern Huntsman to you. Uh, and of course, because this podcast is brought to you in conjunction and in partnership with Modern Huntsman, we have a new competition to win another copy of Volume 3. So we are going to pa- play you an animal sound now. And all you've got to do is email us, contact us on social, and tell us what it is. And we will pick uh, the winner from the correct answers. Well, I hope you uh, hope you can uh, figure out what that was. Volume 4, Modern Huntsman, is now available on pre-order. And very, very soon those pre-orders will be fulfilled because I know it is currently at the printers. As we record this, it, Volume 4 is being printed. And then it'll get, for the rest of the world, outside of North America, uh, it'll be shipped to our London distribution and ready to go. So everyone who's already pre-ordered, it will be the first out the door. So if you want to make sure that you get it uh, as soon as is possible, then get your pre-order. Now, I hope that it can be out by middle of December. Get ordering because Volume 4 is amazing. I have now looked through the whole, I, the whole finished version and it's stunning and the stories are incredible. You're going to love it. And I've got an article in there. Yes, you do. Well, I've got a double page spread on the second page or something. Yeah, Lisa's mum. Yeah. It's um, your uh, article about moose hunting with them last year? Last year, yes. Yeah, last October. Uh, and I have an article in there uh, about uh, Annette Olofsson and my some of my time in Africa this year. Yeah, so it, it's definitely going to be. Uh, it's the same. It's about. It's the same thickness as the previous. It's, exactly I the same. So. Page I think count. it's the same. It's roughly the same size. Yeah. Well, that's value for money right there. So get get ordering for Christmas time because your your partners and loved ones would love. It is this. an amazing Christmas present. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the last thing that I have to say, unless you have uh, anything else you want to add, Daryl, is just a to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, uh, which in our top tier includes Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman, Chris Griffith, John Henry Pete, Tom McCraith, the guys at South Ayrshire Stalking, uh, and James Marchington, and lastly, but not least, but our most recent, James Benjamin Normandale. And I think I forgot you two weeks ago, James. 
Normandale. So I apologize, apologize for getting for you two weeks ago, but I've added you to the board now, so I will no longer forget. Yes. So uh, the for you, you, those of you who don't know, the Patreon uh, helps us uh, put on this podcast, and uh, yeah, it helps us do th- things like trips down to London. Yeah, and even like I went to the, this podcast you're about to yeah, hear. He, I had he to travel, travel to go and see Corin to go and do that. Yeah, so it that's takes... like thirty pounds in in, yeah. in travel. So it, so all helps. it all really does help, and it helps us continue the show. Uh, we have tiers from one dollar, which is I don't know what is it now, about eighty p. 85 pence. 85 maybe. pence. Uh, all the way up to the, the top tier, which you can see. Uh, we also have podcast stickers back in stock. So if uh, any of our Patreon listeners, um, well, sorry, supporters, don't have podcast stickers, we'll get them out to you because we now have ones that go inside your car and outside your car. Uh, and also they're on the shop just for anyone else to buy. So I've overcome my tinted window problem. And they look really good, actually. So. And if there is anything on the shop that you want to order before Christmas, uh, get your orders in soon because apart from Modern Huntsman, which we'll be sending out all the way right until Christmas, um, everything else uh, will probably be closing a little bit early this year. So don't wait. Just go do it. Yeah. And also, we're running low on stock on a lot of stuff. We are. And we're not going to replenish it until start next year. Um, well, I think that's it. I hope that you enjoy this fascinating podcast with Corin Smith. Corin, welcome back to the Into the Wilderness podcast. You you reminded me as I came into your house that it's exactly or oh, almost exactly a year ago that we recorded the last time you were on the show. Yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. Middle of November last year. Yeah, and time has just disappeared. Well, if, when I was thinking about it, I couldn't figure out whether it was one year ago or it was three years ago. I wasn't really <laughs> sure. Time seems to have morphed. Yeah, yeah, into a different different kind of perception of it. Especially having a, a five year old daughter, it's uh, <laughs> times changed. How um how's your how was your year your your year on the river guiding because uh, I mean we're going to talk a lot about um, you know salmon and our fisheries particularly in Scotland today your your background and sort of what you do we we covered in quite some depth on the previous show so if anybody wants to listen to that and find out more about Corin's background go back twelve months ago and listen to the first half of that I think epic two hour long podcast <laughs> yeah yeah, um, yeah but yeah so how, how was your how was your guiding and stuff this year. Well, this year I, I actually took a conscious decision to step back from from guiding. So I, I, I had a few commitments early on in the spring, um, which I uh, which I fulfilled, and then um, but I cut back my schedule considerably and farmed out a lot of the bookings to other guides um, because I want to work. I think we're at a, I feel anyway we're at a, a you know a real critical point in terms of wild salmon conservation where um, you know unless unless you're really unless we start to see some success we are staring down the barrel of these things getting to the point of being in all in you know in all in all seriousness virtually extinct yeah so there, there will be no guiding anymore well exactly yeah so i i wanted to kind of step back and 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 really rip into uh, i guess conservation work around around wild salmon and uh, and the river so that's what i've been doing um, that's what I've been doing all year and then I, I did a little bit of guiding in the spring and I honestly I can't really remember we had um, um, we didn't have a very good spring on the Tummel the, the runs have fallen away dramatically on the River Tummel um, there's all sorts of debates about that I think the River Counter this year is going to struggle to get to 2,000 fish and normally it would for the whole be- season yeah, running through the dam at Pit Lockery. Huh. I can't. I haven't checked for a while, but it's going to struggle. It won't be far off two thousand, and normally, it would be you know, let's say somewhere around about five thousand, and it's sat around wow. about that average for for decades. Um, so there's a lot. That's of, not a small drop. No, no, that's a that's a huge. It's a huge drop, um, and it's been like that for the last couple of years. Um, um, so there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of people who are attributing that to Storm Frank um, and losing year classes of fishes. When so was that? When was Storm Frank? Was that five years ago? Uh, Storm Frank was two thousand and fifteen, I believe. Yeah. November okay. So two- that yeah, that roughly ties in with the cycles. That's why people are suggesting that. Yeah. So I think this next year um, will be very interesting to see what happens. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a very very dramatic decline. You know, if you want to find silver linings, all I can say is thank God we have a counter, because if you were to look at catches on the river, it would completely mask or to a very significant degree it would mask what's what's happening oh that's interesting so what did the catches suggest this year well the catches would suggest a decline so the catches are are, are down a little bit down on the averages but not much you know mm. you, you, nothing like so enough that it could have just been environmental ch- exactly. changes it from could year have been to year c- condition dependent so huh. you, you know it, that um 
th having those two um, those two data points, having the counter and having the catches in in such a small, relatively small river. Or, you know, or it's only five or six miles long, and um, um, the fish move through it pretty quickly. That it, it, that really kind of it brings it, it brings home the the uh, the risks around trying to derive too much information from from pure catch returns about what's happening in rivers. Um, and then you know there is a real need for uh, you know absolute empirical observations. You know there are still issues with with um, with counters, but um, having that those counters to tell you right, there's two thousand fish have gone through the through the counter, um, and not you know normally you'd expect you know let's say on a, on a good year five thousand five thousand plus. You know having that bit of information is uh, is critical when when catch returns don't indicate that 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 same fall off mm. i mean it goes to what I, th I think a lot of people have known for a long time is that catch returns as a measure of the number of salmon i mean it's something we've talked about before i think we probably touched on it in the last podcast um catch returns as a measure of the fish running up the river is a very poor estimate but in many rivers that's all we have and is all we've had historically yeah it is yeah it's an extremely poor estimate especially especially from you know especially where you have declining numbers of fish um it is a poor it's a very poor estimate for the decline of of salmon because there clearly is not a linear relationship between declining numbers and catches um so you know from my from my point of view the, you know one of the big frustrations i have about the all the different debates and uh, and uh, that 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 swirl around wild Atlantic salmon conservation is just the lack of actual indisputable empirical data that tells you right we have x numbers of fish coming into the river um, or you have a you know a very consistent measure like say the the, the counter at the dam which you can argue the toss about whether two thousand fish have gone through or it's one thousand eight hundred or two thousand two hundred you know about yeah there's exactly always going to be a margin for error uh, yeah you, you can argue about exactly how accurate it is but having that those consistent um, uh, like for like measurements year after year after year and you, you you see the you know the the variations the temporal variations and um, that's really really important for informing i think it's a foundation for informing proper proper discussion and debate about what's going on and if we don't you know my it's so frustrating listening to all the, the various arguments about from all the various kind of interested parties about wild atlantic salmon you know we don't have even it would have seemed, you know, a basic understanding about the numbers of fish coming into significant rivers, like the River Tay, for example. Um, and, you know, the, you know, why is that? And is that, you know, from my mind, that's that's unacceptable, and it makes it makes the debates, and, you know, the discussions around it kind of frustrating to the point of being, you know, completely pointless. And I, I tend not to engage in them too much because yeah, because it's very difficult to. Well, in fact, in most cases, it's impossible to give an accurate answer. Well, it just it just becomes a, a swirling ball of opinions. That's all yeah, it is, yeah. and and it's and we all know that people who fish like to have opinions. On yeah, things. yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, and I think it's it's disappointing because there are, um, you know, there are other there are other places around the world which do count their fish and count their fish in much more challenging circumstances. Um, so the idea that, um, you know, at the bottom of the tape, for example, that there isn't a technological solution that exists today to allow us to, to begin counting the numbers of fish entering the tape is, is just a nonsense. And I know there's guys, um, you know, down at Perth and District Anding Club who have been looking at this and doing some work and, and trying to generate some interest in funding. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that kind of stuff should be should should really receive a, a lot of support from... Is it just a money thing? I, I, yeah, I think it's or, a money thing. And, and, and the will to do it from from government? It's a money thing, yeah. And, and you know, my uh, over the last two or three years on the salmon farming front, you know, the the uh, I've spent more and more time getting involved in and with politicians. Um, and I try and resist becoming a conspiracist, but there... There is undoubtedly, um, there is undoubtedly uh, resistance within within government to having, you know, real definitive solid science around these things. Um, because once you have those kind of indisputable numbers, it, it, it's very difficult for people. You know, it's very difficult for politicians to have kind of wiggle room around uh, wiggle room around them. Um, so there, there does seem to be some kind of resistance on that basis. Is it, is it also because knowing numbers of uh, wild salmon running into our rivers across you know the whole country of Scotland isn't really going to win them any favours? It doesn't. It doesn't give them any real political clout when it comes to being voted in again. Do you think there's there's um, them wanting to use their time wisely in inverted commas for for their own benefit? 
Well, I mean, some of that. yeah, absolutely. I mean, politicians have a, a, a limited amount of time. Um, and the reality is that there are a lot of competing interests and um, a lot of loud competing interests at the moment. Um, and, you know, for those projects to receive funding means they have to have, you know, there has to be time and interest in government. And if there's further to be time and interest in government, it has to be an issue that has a significant um, has a significant mandate and and, yeah. and 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 public interest very often. Well, that, yeah, exactly. And so, if the issue is not if the issue isn't of wide public concern, then the reality is that it's you're going to struggle to make to it make sits progress. Pretty low down on the list of to dos. Well, yeah, and again, you know, that is a it's a big question for um, you know, and perhaps you know, one of the criticisms um, that you could label at the the efforts. To uh, to save wild salmon um, is that uh, that it doesn't have that it is perhaps not an issue of, of wide public concern. It is an issue of concern with a, a, a limited number of of of, of um, particular interest groups that are perhaps declining in number as well. Um, and if these projects, you know, if you want to put um, large, you know, big fish counters in rivers. Then you know you're you're going to need broad public support from the local community. And 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 I don't think. I think we're we're beginning to be in danger of of completely communities losing their connection with you know wild salmon and and, and wild things and and when that happens, then you know we we stop knowing about what's happening in rivers and that's when you know you really do start to see existential threats to the to to salmon because it's only by having you know re- a recreational fishing industry which is embedded in our community and is accepted in our community and has broad public support and um, that's kind of the last line of defence between. Um, you know, the wild Atlantic salmon and forces of industry that would seek to exploit those natural resources for, for commercial gain, for commercial gain, for, for for other purposes. And this goes to something that we we talk about quite a lot when we're looking at particularly sort of you know, international hunting is that you need a group of people who have a vested interest in whatever resource it is, whether you want to call it a resource or you know view it as a, a harvestable resource or not. If you don't have a vested interest in something, then there's very little incentive to protect it. And I suppose that is that's what you're saying here, is that you know the people who want to pursue these fish um, for sporting purposes have a vested interest in because they like doing it in making sure that they're there and they're the first people to let uh, everyone know or, or at least talk about it when there's not as many in the running the river this year than there was last year. Sure, and I, I mean the the reality is though that um, you know sporting pursuits were a much bigger were a much bigger part of local, particularly rural communities, were a much bigger part of, of local rural communities even, even 20 years ago, let alone 50, 60, 70, or 100 years ago. And gradually that is being eroded by, uh, you know, other the public having broader uh, other interests. Um, and we see that, you know, we see um, everyone is everyone involved in, in field sports in whatever form is getting, is feeling squeezed and, and feeling marginalised. Um, and I think... You know, my particular interest is recreational fly fishing, and you know, I sit down and think a lot about, you know, what what does the future look like? How do we, you know, in order to ensure that people are still fly fishing in the future, you know, what needs what needs to happen? How does that happen? And you can go down the road of jumping up and down and screaming and shouting and saying, "Well, it's not fair. I want to be able to use the river. I always have done. Um, you know, why am I not? You know, why are there other pressures on, on the river?" Um, why you know why are there less fish? Why is why are people not looking out for my interest? Or you know you can um, look at the you know the wider trends in the, in the general public and what is it that people care about? What are people thinking about? How do I make recreational fishing both acceptable and relevant on a much broader scale? That doesn't necessarily mean about bringing people into the sport. It, it is about having broad public acceptance um, of the sport and support of that pastime. Um, and probably, actually, core to that is having much broader public interest in the in the animal itself. Um, that's really, I think, that's really core to the the future of the sport, which actually is nothing to do. You know, so the fu- the future of the port, the, the future of the sport, in my view, is about um, people having the general public having a real um, 
really identifying with wild Atlantic salmon as being an iconic species in Scotland. Which, for, it, for, which it is. Yeah, yeah, which it is, but for its own sake, yeah. not for... Not the, for not, other purposes. Not for the sake of exploitation. That's, for the sake of the country. Yeah. Like red deer are an iconic species Red on deer, land. golden eagle, wild Atlantic salmon. Yeah. Um, you know, but and the, the really scary thing about the, the decline of species is it's almost it becomes almost a self self perpetuating downward spiral because the less of them, the 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 less people are aware of them, and the less people are aware of them, then the less of a mandate you have to go and protect them, and gradually it gets eroded and eroded and eroded until you have none left, and then that connection is completely broken, and once it's broken, and communities have lost their connection with wild those wild fish it's going to be almost impossible to restore it and you see you know I, I you know you look back at the cultural relevance of of wild atlantic salmon and clearly it's been a, a really iconic species in the context of um, victorian sporting pursuits but it goes back way 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 before that you know you see again this this morning i just saw a post on on social media by um the devron and i think the devron and uh, uh, charitable trust about a Pictish stone in a field up there, which has carvings on it, and one of the carvings is a wild Atlantic salmon. Um, and I know of the, you know, the Gearlock stone um, up in the west oh, yeah, coast, famous one, yeah, 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 which has got a wild Atlantic salmon on it. And these are Pictish, um, you know, Pictish iconography where you know, there could have been, you know, those guys could have put any 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 other animals on there, whether it was hares or cattle or whatever it was, but they put a wild Atlantic salmon. You see them over and over and over again. And that tells us something about just how important and the longevity in terms of that importance, you know, in terms of the role that wild Atlantic salmon plays as an iconic species in Scotland's culture in terms of the in terms of wild things. And we are in we're in danger of of that being, you know, getting to the point of that being completely broken and erased. And it's, I think it's it's easy to forget, especially within the sort of fishing community, because we tend to be quite tunnel-visioned with such things, is that if the salmon go, it's not just the salmon that go. There is a whole knock-on effect of other um, other animals that rely on this run of fish. Now, it's very obvious in places like North America because you see the bears eating the fish. You see lots of other things eating the fish. We don't see it quite as visually here, but it, it's happening, you know, even from you know, the smallest little fry that's hatching being eaten by the kingfisher to the, the otters eating them to, you know, a, any number of well, other birds. I mean, never mind freshwater pearl mussels. In terms of establishing what the, the importance of wild Atlantic salmon with the general public, that, you know, and what do we talk to the general public about? Um, it's exactly those kind of things we need to be talking about. That the wild Atlantic salmon are an iconic species, but actually they are a, a really key indicator species because they represent the essential. They are the they represent the health of a river. If there's an abundance of Atlantic salmon, you know everything is going well in that river. If there's not, then you know there are real problems. And by everything. You know, if there's an abundance of Atlantic salmon, that means you have more otters, more kingfishers, more dippers. It means the bug life is healthy. Everything from top to bottom in that river, for Atlantic salmon to be in abundance, has to be really healthy. And and um, you know, in terms of understanding how healthy our rivers are, the reality is the Scottish government looks to organisations like SEPA and who do you know a variety of tests and have standards and guidelines and you know do businesses comply with this? Do businesses comply with that? And it's ridiculous that we have a situation where um, businesses that are that are making use of river resources, for example, you can have an 80-90% compliance rate, um, uh, but yet Atlantic salmon and things like sea trout and brown trout and kingfishers are all telling you that there's a huge problem in the river. And, and actually what government should be looking at in terms of measuring that the environmental health is not compliance rates against kind of some abstract policy. It's what is the, you know, what are the, What's the biodiversity in these rivers? And so finding issues that are of relevance to the general public and talking to the general public about why Atlantic salmon are important, um, you know, that's the discussion about Atlantic salmon can be a discussion about kingfishers and birds and bird life on the rivers. For Which it should be. Which, you know, which you have enormous armies of people who are interested in birds and, and, and would be bought into that, that line, that narrative. You know, it can be about, it can be about otters and the bigger predators. Um, it can be about the bug life in the river um, uh, and the importance of the, you know, the, aqua the aquatic invertebrates. Um, and you will find, you know, you will find people uh, in in 
the general public who are interested in that area. And so Atlantic salmon represent, they sit atop all of those different issues and those different interest areas. And, uh, you know, I think those are the discussions we need to be going out and having and, and doing a, a lot more around in terms of engaging the general public with the things they care about on the rivers, of which Atlantic salmon are the ultimate kind of representation of that system, those those ecosystems being healthy and being in good shape. And where they're not, everyone should care about it because it indicates that there's problems with kingfishers, otters, bug life, dippers, the whole lot. It's the canary in the coal mine. It is the canary in the coal mine, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just going back to what we were saying about vested interest in a river system and you know fishermen having a reason to care whether there's actually fish coming back in. You know, one of the arguments that uh, is often gets raised is, well, if you care so much about the fish, why are you catching them? You know, if we have these rapidly declining populations, is it not detrimental to then fish for them? How does how does that conversation square? You know, it's something that um, for, for people who don't fish, it comes up quite a lot when I'm having discussions. Yeah, and it's it's one of those issues that I think has been ducked for for decades. No one's really no one's really kind of from because it, it kind of ties into the catch and release question too. It does, yeah, um, and. The, the reality is that the anglers have to accept, and in terms of justifying um, recreational fly fishing in the future and to the general public, it's you know you're not going to make any progress with that if you deny your impact right from the get go. That it's not going to be helpful at all, and and certainly you know this year I've probably thought about that more than I ever have in, in a large part because of the work I've been doing with um, on the salmon farming front and touring a film with um, Patagonia. Oh, we'll big, talk about that next, yeah, yeah. The big clothing brand and the work that I was doing with them touring that film around Europe. Obviously, Patagonia's demographic it is... is the, the people who are coming to the films are not interested in fly fishing. They're not particularly interested in wild salmon. And they're not, you know, they're not coming from a, a background of, of campaigning against salmon farming. The, you know, their Patagonia's demographic is 20 sort of early 20s to, to mid 30s, really environmentally aware, really consumer conscious, climate aware, um, you know, quite a lot of, uh, at, you know, probably closer uh, on the spectrum, more interested in animal rights than they would be in, in kind of hunting or recreational fishing or anything. And, I, you know, I've been challenged by those audiences, um, whether it's been in, you know, usually the suburban audiences, either in London um, or, you know, a, um, toured the show, toured the film into Berlin, um, Amsterdam and places like that, where you're really challenged by some of these audiences on the recreational fly fishing front. And I've gone away and had to really think about, well, you know, how do you justify a pursuit which is inherently cruel? There's no way you can, there's no way you can flower that up. It is inherently cruel. Anyone who seeks to deny that is frankly um, uh, hammering a nail into the, the <laughs> coffin that is the future of recreational mm. fly fishing because sticking your head in the sand is not going to help. Yeah. Inward um, reflection is always the first port uh, of call with such things. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I've been really challenged on that by by those by those audiences. Um, and so I've thought a lot about it and that has really brought me to those questions of, well, I feel like I'm a conservationist um, and I want to conserve, but, but am I? Is the sport, what contribution is the sport of fly fishing making to the um, decline of wild Atlantic salmon. Um, what contribution is it making to saving Atlantic salmon? And I've, I've thought about that a lot. You know, where I've got to on it so far is that you don't save wild places and wild animals by separating yourselves from them. There's a difference between going and looking at things and, and being part of the cycle of life and death in a, in a wild place. Um, it is not the same to just wander into a wild environment, into the middle of it, and grab a pair of binoculars and look at stuff. You don't have that same sensitivity um, as to as to what's happening. And I know that it, from the point of view of, of 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 hunting and of fishing, people who don't do it will look at it and they just see it as a destructive process. Whereas I don't, and I think the, the argument that I've made um, to the members of the audience who've come from an animal rights background, for example, is that it is an inherently cruel it is an inherently cruel pastime but the the ultimately it is recreational fly fishermen that have formed the last line of defense between wild atlantic salmon's ultimate complete and utter eradication um, through forces of industry um, and so the the contribution as a whole um in terms of protecting and preserving a species 
I think is massively outweighs the the impact that the direct impact that 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 recreational fishing has on and on has on a spe- has on the species in terms of the mortality that's associated with it, and that could be as simple as fish that are killed by um, fly fishermen or fish that die as as part of being caught and released. Um, that that is outweighed by the the benefits of having recreational fly fishermen in the river caring about the animal being aware of what's going on and seeing the seeing the subtle changes and that's where I think you know I, I, from my own personal experiences you know as a as a kid I grew up on a farm in the hills and you know when I from the age of about I don't know from about eight or something um, until I was a teenager you know hunting hunting rabbits was pretty much all I did in, all, <laughs> in, in my spare time yes well, I can uh, my, my life was paralleled <laughs> um, but that you know it, you don't realize it at the time but now going back and reflecting as a kid you know I would sit out um you know on a, on a summer's evening I would schlep to the top of my, you know the hill on the farm and I'd sit in the heather and I'd sit there for hours yeah. uh, often just immersed yeah just just watching watching rabbits come out of their you know their their warrens and stuff and running around and then of course yes I'd I'd shoot them, um which is it, it you know on reflection now well as an adult now I, I don't really have any interest in I, I no interest really in shooting the rabbit just for the sake of it I'd far rather sit there and watch and observe, but as a kid that process of observing the rabbits and beginning to learn and understand about you know when they would be around when you'd see them. Um, but also, you know, all the other stuff that that was round about it, whether it was, you know, whether it was buzzards or birds of prey um, that were kicking around, or you know, you'd see other wildlife out and about. You, you, you were part of that. You weren't. You weren't. Uh, sort you weren't of a, just a spectator. You, yeah. No, you weren't. You were in the middle of that and observing stuff. And I was. You, you, you were. You, you had a. You absorbed the environment around you, and you had a real sensitivity to what that environment was like and, or what it what it should be like and any changes that that happened to that you know so rabbit decline for example disease and things you were really sensitive to that I, I, yeah because suddenly you didn't see as many coming out of the world yeah and you know i think today it's it's become increasingly difficult i can only imagine what i what i don't really i don't really know anybody of that sort of age range that we're talking like we were um, doing such things who are doing that but now with okay i don't have it in my pocket my phone sitting there almost everywhere you are you're connected and I'm not sure if I had that in my pocket when I was doing that kind of stuff, if I would have been quite as in tune. Yeah. Because I wonder whether I would have been distracted continually. Whereas exactly what you say, I mean, I would spend days in my summer holiday doing stuff just like that. I should just point out, for because we do have people who listen who are not, who don't necessarily fish or hunt. And it's, I think it's important just to point this out, is that gen- generally speaking, rabbits are pest species and are, you know, culled around the country because they damage a lot of agricultural crops. And so this, or even, I mean, even if it's not a crop, even the one place that I used to shoot on a lot, it was actually because uh, it was for sheep grazing because he had so many bloody rabbits. Yeah, yeah. No, it was the same on the farm. Um, But, you know, now I have absolutely no interest at all in just going out and and sitting on a hill and shooting rabbits or pretty much anything for that matter. But I'm also absolutely convinced that had I not done that, I, I wouldn't care as much as I do about wild things and wild places because you formed I, I don't really know how to articulate it you form a connection and an affinity with wild things and wild places which runs much deeper than a than a, a kind of a conscious connection it's a sub i have a subconscious connection to these places that um i feel incredibly protective of them and and that i, I would not i don't think i would have gained that by any other means it, it, it was it was but i had to go out it's it's through hunting and engaging with 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 the animals on that basis uh, in terms of sitting down, observing in detail what they're doing and how they're behaving and everything else around about it, that you become part of it and you become protective of it. And although I have no interest really in shooting, I have no interest in shooting animals um, at all anymore, um, although, you know, everyone who knows me will know I've done plenty of it in the past. I still, you know, my five-year-old daughter, um, I still, I was thinking about it today when I was when I was out in the hills that I, I still think that I will want her at some point to experience hunting because I, I can't, I, I was just thinking, how is that? Or I, I'm not completely sure whether I do or I don't, but I was thinking today, you know, how, how am I going to give her that connection with these wild places to, to really help her care about it? You know, other than taking her into the hills and having her kind of sit down and sit around and look at stuff, 
but you don't doing that is not enough. You're not you don't connect with the place in the same way as you do when you hunt. Um, and and I think you know it's obviously a lot of navel gazing going on, mm. but I I do think there is something there's something in that which which is something <laughs> we need to get better at articulating in yeah. terms of you genuine conservation and genuine affinity with the land only uh, the land and wild things and wild places it, it does not come through just being a tourist basically it comes through being on the land working the land which inherently means there's you know you're going to be having an impact in the context of recreational fly fishing that to me is the, is the justification for when i fish is you know, it, it's the justification for it is that it is connecting me with that place in a way that nothing else can, and it is it, it's only by it's only through that medium that the passion I have and the motivation I have to to protect those wild places from whether it's dams or um, uh, unsustainable and, and damaging agricultural practices or whether it's industrial forces. If it wasn't for me being on the river and fly fishing, you wouldn't see. I wouldn't be aware of the impacts of those things. And you see it in a very, very different way. Yeah. It's like you, you, you walk the river after a flood and you see what used to be a spawning red that's no longer there anymore. And you know fine well that that's all been scoured up and washed downstream and you're, not gonna, you're basically not going to see any of the fish that spawned there yeah. in five years' time. Well, but yeah. most people will never look at it like that unless you have a reason to uh, dig into the life cycle of this you know, secretive fish that... Well, you exactly. see jump from time to time, but, uh, but unless you're really looking because you're probably fishing, you're trying to see where they're lying or you're trying to actually catch them, you know, why would you care? It's kind of a passing thought, oh, a fish jumped. Well, well exactly. And I, so I think, you know, maybe in simple terms, it's as, it, it's as simple as, you know, you, you have to get your hands dirty. If, you don't, if you're not getting your hands dirty in, the, in a, a wild place with wild animals, if you're not in there getting your hands dirty, I don't think you're ever going to have that connection with that place. Um, and from the recreational fly fishing point of view and making sure that it's it's culturally relevant and has wild, wide social acceptance and really driving, you know, really in kind of engaging people with genuine, the genuine kind of conservation ethos of the, of the sport. Um, I think we just need to do a lot more about articulating, articulating that and making it clear that, um, that that is you know that that is the benefit of the sport to the to the to the place um, and to the, and to the animal. And it, what would you say to? Because uh, like you, you know, this is a question I've asked myself for quite a few years. But as as you know, as someone who fishes or someone who fishes is listening to this and they're thinking, you know what, you know, I love to fish. I don't think I do do enough. You know, I I, I do care, but I don't feel like I do enough. What can your average person who likes to fish do to try and contribute? Um, I mean, I think, again, it's tricky. I, you know, f I think that the first thing I would say is you, you, if you're a fly fisherman and there's probably, a, a you know, potentially this is going to kick off some sort of internal sort of s debate about, you know, snobber snobbery, conservation snobbery around recreational fly fishing. And we already see it, you know, I think in catch and release, you know, you have people who are, pro catch and release and you have people who say you know five you know recreational fly fishing say it's entirely pointless it's pointless to the extent that i should be able to to to, to take a fish and, and eat it otherwise what on earth is the point and you see people sort of reaching for the moral high ground in that debate so i think we need to be careful about that but from my point of view you know the way i the way i think about it is and you know in a, I'll frame it in a in a context outside of of wild Atlantic salmon fishing in Scotland. But as you know, I worked as a actually spent more time working as a tropical saltwater fly fishing guide overseas than I ever have working in uh, working in Scotland. And bonefish were one of the the target species that that we used to chase in the Seychelles. And every so often, when you got lucky, you'd find these massive schools of bonefish. It, it's it's thrilling to see and it's thrilling to catch these fish. It, it, it genuinely is. But then there also comes a point where you're standing there thinking this it, it's gone beyond it's gone beyond um kind of giving someone helping someone kind of achieve a goal and achieve a name um, and enjoy that thrill of presenting the fly seeing the fish come up and that, that whole visual aspect of the fish eating uh, and fighting the fish and all the, the the thrill around that to actually now these guys are just making a pig of themselves and catching fish after fish after fish and i think that it, it's it's in there where you start to have to look at look at what you're doing and question 
how is what's happening now has it gone beyond kind of being a responsible a responsible angler to just actually kind of you know just make an absolute pig of yourself and the red mist comes down and I'm just catching and catching and catching because of the thrill of it and and I'm having a, I'm having an impact I'm having a you know a considerable impact now for uh on the on on the environment and in the case of you know bonefish if we, you know you would see often the bonefish that you caught would get zapped by a a shark afterwards okay just because they're a bit more vulnerable and yeah yeah exactly so I think it's about you know first and foremost saying you know am I am I being responsible is this um, is what I'm doing being responsible and am I the way I'm fishing is it minimizing the impact so things simple things like fishing with barbless hooks um, or not doing absolutely brain dead things like fishing two pound test to big <laughs> to big fish where yeah. all your people trying to, some people seem to have this thing about lighter and lighter tackle just to say that they landed a big fish on light tackle which yeah, I've never I, really understood well that that's the trophy side of things um and I I think that's it, it's a uh, you know, it, it's a it, it, it's an indulgence we can't afford anymore. So you know, making sure that you're fishing with tackle that's that's heavy that's heavy enough to allow you to get the to get the eat, but um or light enough, sorry, to, to allow you to get the eat, but but heavy enough that you you can play the fish uh, and and capture the fish as quickly as, as 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 reasonably possible, and and be competent enough so that the fish you are landing the fish on the basis that you are skilled and able to land it often before it's ready, as opposed to playing it out until, until the thing is completely whacked. Yeah, yeah, until the thing is basically dead. Um, so I think there's there's those there's those kind of practices that you can those kind of things that you can think about when you're when you're in and around a river, um, and then. You know, and I'm talking about wild fishing here. I'm not talking about um, stocked fisheries or anything. I think they, they are, you know, they are, they have, they, they don't even kind of enter into the discussion as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, it's an artificial environment that's created. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's very, very difficult to justify a, a put and take fishery where you're filling up a, a hole in the ground full of rainbow trout simply to catch them for a bit of fun and then put them back. I, I, I struggle with that massively. I get that the, in terms of recruitment into the sport, it maybe plays a role, but I, I think it's extremely difficult to justify. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about wild fishing. I mean, you could just, in that case, you could just keep your six fish for the day and go home. Yeah, yeah. Which is what, I, as a little kid, I mean, okay, I started fishing for pike in the hill locks above uh, Loch Ness, which we ate. That was how I started fishing. But when we moved here... We were there was used to be a put and take fishery, but we we would always do it where I think the the limit was six. I catch my six fish and we go home and eat them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no sort of cat. But then you know I was fishing worm on a yeah on a on a float, so they normally swallow them put down too deep to be able to put them back anyway. So I mean, I think there's a there's maybe we need to ask some questions about you know that kind of fishing as well. But there is a way to still do it. Um, well, I, I, but I think you know. So there's looking at yourself and your practices and your kind of mindset, and then you know the re, the reality is is it, you know it, it, we kind of outsource the responsibility for conservation at the moment because we pay, you know, we pay our permits uh, to fish, and they you know the, we pay a reasonable you know we pay a, a reasonable amount of money in some cases a lot of money, um, and part of that permit. Um, part of that fee is a contribution to local fishery boards, for example. So but it's very passive, though, isn't it? That yeah, contribution. yeah. So we, we kind of outsource that to to them, and and the responsibility of cons- conservation lies with them. And so I think actually, you know, going forward, I think it'd be healthier for the industry. Um, I think we need to establish a culture of of more, in, you know, more engagement with places where I'm fishing. You know, what contribution am I making to the you know to the well being of this place? Um, and that could be, you know, it might involve outsourcing that to, to local NGOs, but I think doing more from a practical basis, it could be as simple as if you're on the river and you, you know, you're walking back to your car and you see some litter or plastic or rubbish lying about, just pick it up, take it away, take responsibility for that, for that place and make a contribution. It could be as simple as that. And, and you know, that stuff does, does, does make a difference. Do you think that the, um, the sort of the, the the wider fishing community, and by that I'm sort of extending it to to manufacturers and the businesses that are that are attached to it. Do you think there, there's a way that they could do more to help encourage that? Yes, basically, and I think the the, the tackle manufacturers um, and apparel manufacturers they are um, clearly interested in selling their products, and a, a lot of that is focused on sort of technical product innovation um, and and talking about the the product in terms of how the product is going to help you catch more fish yeah. um, um because of course what i have in the cupboard is not good enough yeah yeah exactly um but what we see in you know in in 
um, the commercial, the wider retail commercial environment is that everyone is talking about. Everyone is desperate to get on the the sustainability um, uh, bandwagon, you know, environmental bandwagon, animal rights, ethical bandwagon, all that kind of stuff. Everyone is wanting to get on that, and they're desperate to prove their credentials. And I would hope that um, you know, brands, fly fishing brands, are looking at that and and seeing that move because inevitably it will permeate. You know, if if put it this way, again, if if the wider public is is heading in that general direction, and and fly fishing is not, it, it pretty much, it, you know, that's a strong indicator about, you know, the future, the, the 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 place that that sport has in the future in terms of the general public's perception of it. But I think equipment manufacturers they do need to do a lot more in terms of the 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 benefits they are deriving from from wild Atlantic salmon being in the rivers and people fishing are considerable. Um, and I think they do need to look at the, the contributions they're making either to um, to NGOs and organizations or in terms of the culture that they are setting through their through their marketing and um, their their product development um, and making you know should fly fishing well salmon fishing I see probably a, a hundred a hundred to one in terms of content um, about um, being able to cast further and longer uh, in salmon fishing than I do about than, than I see about conservation. You know, if the if all of the effort that was that, that goes in, you know, if some of the effort that goes into innovation around lines, innovation around rods, innovations around reels and materials, um, you know, if, if some of that effort went into considering issues of conservation um, and uh, protecting the resource from which their business business derives de- be- considerable benefits, um, I think it would be uh, I think it would be a useful thing. Yeah, we we see a very similar thing, you know, in the hunting world. You know, if I see one more scope manufacturer advertising their scope with biggest fuck off red deer world record beside it, yeah, it just it doesn't. You know, that is not what it's about, and we spend all our time talking about that's not what it's about. And yet, you pick up a magazine, and you still see a gun or a not all the time, but you still see it, a gun or a scope or ammunition or whatever. It's like, you have this means that you can kill the biggest thing. Yeah. And yet, most of the time we're talking about, oh, that's, not, that's not what it's about. That's not who I am as a hunter. And yet, they, we still advertise it. I mean, we still advertise it because there are people who that is reflective of. But yeah, I mean, yeah. To, to your point, I, well, I'd I, like to see less of that. Well, I mean, the, the, the danger with that is that you've, you're shifting, for me, which is, and I'm interested in, in. I'm a wild fly fisherman. That's that. That's what I am. Um, you know, you're shifting what you're shifting it from being a, a big, broad experience about being out in the wild. To, to you're reducing it down to simply about catching, and that that yeah. is what it's all about. And that is extremely. I think that's extremely destructive in the long term, um, because everyone wants to catch fish but especially in the case of wild atlantic salmon fishing in scotland not everybody catches fish and you don't always catch fish so there is something else that's sustaining you beyond you know it simply can't just catching be the fish. results it's not mm. and you know it is for the vast majority of people that that i interact with it's a much broader experience it's about the 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 catch is the culmination um, and is you know is perhaps you know it's the icing on the cake that that's that is what it is i am you know, often very content and particularly, you know, clients who work in, in very, you know, pressured jobs um, and work extremely hard, they're very content to, to be out there in a quiet, wild place, in a watery place, um, immersed in that, watching the world go by, um, you know, seeing seeing the kingfishers, seeing the otters, seeing the dippers working away, seeing the, you know, the trout rising and um, the mayfly coming off or caddis and everything and, and, and sitting there and identifying it that to me is what, what what fly fishing is all about the catch is a is a is part of it and to 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 only focus on that and turn you know essentially turn it into something that resembles a trophy you know a, a pursuit of a trophy which is you know it's much easier to um to create a motivation around buying you know tackle around something as specific sell. as that yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's unhelpful for the industry in the long term. Um, it should be a much, it should be a much bigger and a much broader pitch um, from a from a tackle from a tackle perspective. And I think, you know, if if that if the wider if the wider kind of um, the wider attitudes, uh, you know, in the general public are are, are going to seep into to fly fishing, then I, I would think manufacturers and apparel, um, you know, guys making clothing and stuff, they will they will have to head in that direction. 
Um, and certainly, you know, I've been at Kendall Mountain Film Festival this weekend um, uh, uh, hosting kind of discussions and talks on salmon farming with um, with Patagonia. And although it's an outdoor festival, it's nothing to do with fishing at all. It's about um, being, you know, climbing, trail running, all that jazz, skiing. Um, the the effort those brands are putting in to position themselves as being, you know, sustainable, environmentally friendly in terms of the, you know, the products they're producing, because a lot of them are big, you know, big corporates, especially, you know, someone like Patagonia. Um, you know, they are all working really, really hard to demonstrate their credibility and um, and make really significant changes in their organization. They're, you know, someone like Patagonia is, you know, they're discouraging consumers from buying just um, frivolous products. They're saying, you know, they're running... Because they do the repair They're doing a, right? worn, yeah. a, a worn wear program, which yeah. is bring your jacket back and we'll, we'll patch it up. Um, and they're saying, you know, they're still a commercial organization. There's no doubt about it. There's, but they're saying... You know, if you have to buy a jacket, then come and buy a jacket from us. But only if you have to buy it. But if you buy a jacket from us, um, you know, and there you, you rip it or something a, a year or so later, then come back and we'll repair it. Don't go and you know, chuck it in the bin and just buy another one because you can. Um, and so that you know, it, that outdoor space is becoming completely taken over by that by that kind of mindset. And I think it's a good thing. There's lots of problems Absolutely with it, a good thing. and everyone can shout about snowflakes and all that kind of stuff. But um, the, uh, if it's know, making us more conscious and responsible for our actions, you know, I'm for that. Yeah, no, no, me too. And I, I think, you know, again, I, I look, uh, you know, you look at that, uh, you know, wandering around Kendall Mountain Film Festival, you know, I, I'm wandering around there thinking, what, you know, what place does um, something like recreational fly fishing have in in that space? Because uniquely, Fly fishing, it, it, it does occupy this unique space in terms of a field sport, which I think it is. And I often yeah. refer to it as the, the softest field sport. Mm -hmm. you, you will never see um, hunting or shooting in, in these kind of places, like in an, in an outdoor mountain film festival. I've tried. No, yeah. no you won't. <laughs> no. But you will see fly fishing. And, you know, the, there are some bizarre examples of that where, uh, like Teton Gravity Research, one of the biggest kind of outdoor kind of extreme film producers in the US who make some of the most incredible skiing and snowboarding movies. You know, they have a, they have a, a forum uh, for, you know, people to chat about stuff. And th there's sort of, I think there's three... There was, the last time I looked, which was about a year or so ago, there was sort of three big sporting forums. And one was obviously skiing and snowboarding. The other one was surfing. And then it was fly fishing. Um, and, you know, the Tetons and um, uh, is obviously um, near Yellowstone and, and yeah. the home of kind of lots and lots of fly fishing around there. But fly fishing is, you know, it, it is embedded in an outdoor culture there, but, you know, a young, vibrant outdoor culture where people are also skiing and surfing. I've seen it when I've been in Bozeman in Montana, yeah. yeah. And mountain biking and all that stuff. And so fly fishing has a, is clearly, a, is clearly a fundamental part of that. It's often the second, you know, the second sport. But um, America doesn't have that traditional, that long-standing traditional kind of place where fly fishing has, has been a, a Victorian sporting yeah, pursuit. Yeah. It's a different. It's kind more of, hip there. Yeah, it's a different Here kind of like culture. It's almost, and I love the tradition that we have, but it can be viewed from the outside as quite archaic. Yeah, and I'm not saying that that, that, that recreational fly fishing in the UK needs to be Americanized because it doesn't. You know, the, the reasons that that people come there is a considerable um, uh, Scotland as, as a recreational fly fishing destination. There is considerable interest in that. Um, you know, to, to come and fish for Atlantic salmon, and it's because of its traditional, its traditional. Uh, um, roots uh, and in its heritage, but um, clearly, you know that the American kind of experience dic would show that fly fishing can have a place in a, a very significant place and an acceptance by the general public. Um, and so we just need to get the you know we need to get the message we need to get the messaging right and the narrative right, which is getting away from you know it being all about catching and killing fish simply for a recreational pursuit we have to talk about a much bigger the, the, the all the much bigger benefits and that comes all the way back to well how do you justify something that is um and it's most base basic level in terms of the way you interact with with the animal is inherently cruel how do you justify it well that is how you justify it i think one of the other issues that we have in terms of like a, a public conversation is that there is this perception especially with regard to salmon fishing and uh, on some rivers and some beats, the associated cost that goes with it is that it's an old white man's sport. 
And uh, that doesn't sit very well with you know a lot of people. That's the perception of it. Whereas I'm I'm thinking now that what made me think that was I just floated the Yellowstone when I was in Montana. I always wanted to do that since I was a little kid, and I had the chance to do it. And yeah, okay, there was uh, some guides with some you know o- older people there, but most of the people I met on the river were all pretty young. Yeah, which was unusual for me compared to fishing here. Yeah, well, I mean that that is the, that is the reality of the demographic that 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 is um, interested in, particularly in salmon fishing in Scotland, which is an expensive, you know, it's expensive and it's exclu- it, it, it is expensive. It's exclusive to the extent that the, 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 the most, ex- you know, the most expensive beats are very expensive, but um, it is, there is a high level of participation um, and access to affordable salmon fishing oh, throughout, there's lots throughout there, yeah. Scotland. Yeah. And I think it is it, necessary to have that elite, particularly with, with with um, wild Atlantic salmon fishing, which is iconic, um, and you know the the parallel I would offer is something like golf, where it is necessary to have St Andrews, Carnoustie, and Troon, um, and the, and you know in inverted commas I hate this phrase, but the the working man doesn't have access to them on the basis that they're ridiculously expensive. Yeah. But there's but, also a Brecon golf course. But, well, there is, yeah, yeah, and so <laughs> yeah. You, you know, but and it's the it's the existence of the the um, the 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 really aspirational elite golf courses that that keeps the industry hopefully keeps that industry going and relevant worldwide mm. and it um, feeds down and it feeds down to all yeah. the other possibilities it does yeah. yeah and as and as long as the benefits do feed down yeah. then um because I, I fished I think all, that's all around Scotland for for salmon and I and the only time I've ever fished on on what would be regarded as one of the classic expensive beats is when I've been invited <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> as a guest the rest is all association water you know which is like 15 pounds a day or whatever so yeah. yeah it does exist but this this notion of kind of the rich white old guy fishing um i mean that that's an image problem and that comes back to my point that um for recreational fly fishing whether it's salmon fishing or wild trout fishing um in order for it to be you know relevant in the next 20 to 30 years um it's about finding those elements within that within the sport that appeal to people who aren't old retired men yeah um, and finding how do you know how are we going to engage with families um who have a whole load of other options and, and entertainment options and you see you know now with the declining numbers of wild salmon you know some of the more progressive beats in the states you know they're looking at monetizing you know their access and their right to access on the river through ways other than just salmon fishing you know there are i've had plenty of days where i've just had friends you know, I've taken a beat and I've just had friends on the river and there's a nice hut um, and just had a barbecue and had yeah. friends there. Barbecue, uh, a few whiskeys. Yeah, yeah. And you don't, you, you know, you, it doesn't have to be about going out on the river. You, you're still part of it there. Um, uh, and, you know, maybe, the, you know, maybe looking at how, how fishing, uh, you know, I'm kind of freewheeling here, but having people on the river who wouldn't necessarily be, normally be there, they, they don't have to be there fishing and trying hard and flogging away. You can just be on the river doing stuff and that engages them and with that place and that space. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's maybe the pathway, you know, that is the pathway. Maybe there's one or people, one or two people fishing in the in the group um, and everyone else is sitting around eating sausages. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, but, yeah. um, you know, we have to get away from that image, but that is, you know, that is about, making sure that we're telling stories and producing content that is that that, that that demonstrate that that's not the case that there are you know there's there is an experience there to be had which is fantastic for families I, i've said it over and over and i've had you know in in the in the on the in the guiding business in scotland some of the most satisfying days are taking out young families or families with young kids and um you know fishing for wild brown trout and catching almost nothing because um, everyone's completely hopeless technically. Yeah. But you have a brilliant day. You know, yeah. there's bugs like there's kids at the you know the kids at the front and of the boat the, screaming yeah. as, or like, they're paddling in the shallows finding bugs yeah, and lifting yeah. well, stones. Yeah, well screaming blue murder because damsels are landing on them and stuff like that <laughs> and um but then you know you have a nice barbecue and then there's the minnows and then you do eventually catch a fish and maybe you, you know maybe you eat the, the the trout at lunchtime or something I don't know but um that is a it's a fantastic way for families to engage with a wild place and everything that's going on. Other than you know, what what's the alternative for that? Fa- you know, family families coming up from um, Essex and and things like that. What's the alternative? Is that they get in a, a four wheel drive vehicle and are kind of driven around and and look out the window at stuff? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, that's where I think fly fishing has a real compelling a real compelling kind of experience um, to to sell to people. Um, but you know, that comes down to 
genuinely having you know a, a strong kind of conservation ethic and 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 finding your place you know in amongst a whole load of competing interests at the moment. Yeah. Um. Tell me a little bit about the the film that you mentioned that, that's been touring. Um. I haven't actually uh, I haven't actually seen it yet. Right. Uh, but I, I know roughly the the gist of it. But explain the film because it's now online, so anybody can go and watch it. Right. Yeah. So the, I've been touring with um a, a film all summer. Well, all spring and summer, which is called Artificial, which is a film that was produced by Patagonia, the big big clothing brand. Um, and it's about um, hatcheries, so enhancement hatcheries in the US, which is, um, for those who are unaware, is essentially producing large numbers of salmon in sheds and putting them in rivers so that there's more fish in the rivers for people to catch, whether that's recreational or commercial. Yeah, so there was two aspects to this, what they were doing. It was yeah. also for netting, commercial Yes, extraction. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the film's about enhancement, natura- and enhancement hatcheries and actually that, um, you know, uh, the the enhancement hatcheries may add fish to the rivers, but they may be part of the problem in terms of representing a threat to the wild populations of fish in those rivers as well. Um, and then the other aspect of the film, it looked at salmon farming um, and the impact of open cage salmon farming on the runs of, of wild salmon in populations. In North America? In North America and in Europe, in Norway oh, okay. and in Iceland. Uh, so it examined those two areas, which are pretty, you know, pretty controversial areas, um, and it's online now. So if you go onto YouTube and look for Artificial Patagonia, you'll you'll find it, um, uh, and you can watch it. It's an hour and twenty minutes long. Um, so I, I've been kind of working with Patagonia for the last couple of years, um, essentially trying to strong arm them into doing something on salmon farming because I thought it was a great fit for the brand, um, and I was absolutely convinced that. Um, in order to get anywhere with the, the 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 work I do on salmon farming and um, essentially trying to take that industry on, that I needed to take the message beyond um, the traditional recreational fly fishing um, uh, audience in Scotland. Who you know I don't need to convince. There's every single person who in Scotland who fishes for wild Atlantic salmon and sea trout knows that salmon farms are incredibly damaging. So I I didn't want to stay inside the echo chamber, and I, I wanted to take the message out to um, a much bigger od- a much broader audience, but a completely different demographic. And Patagonia, a big American brand, and um, which has been built up for years and years and years on the basis of being um, more being environmentally aware about. Um, They've always had a, a conservation focus because of their founding members. Conservation and ethic, you know, really ethical, um, a, a business with real ethics. But ethics on the basis that it's still a big corporate making clothing and producing clothing and having an impact. Yep. Um, but looking to um, genuinely um, find the problems with those those processes and hold their hand up and try and do something about them. But their their um, demographic was, was really interesting to me. Again, you know, mid mid 20s to mid 30s environmentally aware consumer conscious um, so i'd been badgering them for a while to to kind of to pile into the salmon farming debate and, and um then they produced the film and things just as they often seem to do just sort of naturally um collided and uh patagonia asked me to um join uh join them uh to help support touring this film around europe and and the uk um, to work as a, um, a a guest speaker and panelist when we were when we were screening the films, uh, and to talk about the issues of salmon farming in particular, uh, the, the hatchery stuff is really not my my area of expertise. There were there was um, other guys who were who were talking about that and that the impacts um, that they might uh, potential risks around that that they might represent. Um, uh, my kind of ish, area of kind of expertise was salmon farming, and so we toured that film. Um, I think the first place I actually went was East Berlin, of all places. <laughs> Karl Marx Strasse. Um, <laughs> um, but incredibly, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it has genuinely amazed Did me. Did they still call it East Berlin? It was, it was the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall yeah, just yeah, last well, week. It yeah. was, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's still it's still East Berlin and the, the wall was there and um, um, we w- went to um, a big auditorium in East Berlin and w- it was full. It was like, I, I can't remember how many were there, but it was certainly a, a couple of hundred, 250, maybe 300 people. And that entire, you know, I, I, we were there um, with in the uh, reception area with people coming in um, to begin with and chatting to people then. And out of all the people, in fact, I asked the question, I asked people in the audience to put their hands up who, who was a fly fisherman. And out of the couple hundred people that were there, I think about three people put their oh, hands wow. up. So the people so that were, wasn't your audience. 
No, well, it's not the audience I was looking no, for. No, I know it wasn't. But yeah, just to the, emphasize the point, th- these were these were not people who fished. No, no, this was a film. Yeah, that, although that this was <clears throat> what people would perceive as a film by a fly fisherman uh, from you know Yvonne Schuenard, who runs, um, who owns um, Patagonia, uh, crazy about fly fishing. This was a film which was born out of a, a guy who's interested in fly fishing, wanting to talk about the issues. Um, and they are essentially, you know, issues around recreational fly fishing and um, or concerns to do with the numbers of wild fish in rivers. But the people who were coming to see it had no interest in that at all. They weren't they weren't fly fishermen. Um, they weren't particularly uh, aware of the issues to do with far, salmon farming um, or anything like that. These are um, again, as I say, young people between you know mid twenty, mid thirties, environmentally aware, consumer conscious. Um, probably um, more interested in animal rights than they are in anything else. Um, interested in questions of sustainability, you know, what food should I be eating? Can I trust the food, you know, food labelling that I'm eating? Um, and those are the, that that theme has continued, um, except it, it's changed basically. The, the further north you go and uh, in, in the UK, and the more and more you, you, you go into smaller and smaller communities, closer and closer and closer, to say salmon farms, for example, and also you did that here up the up the yeah, west, yeah, a yeah. few locations up the west coast. It also showed, right? Yeah, no, I did definitely. Um, then the conversation changed a little bit more. Then it became more technical about salmon farming, more specific about hatcheries, and certainly more heated about <laughs> um, debates about um, hatcheries and and whether they were a good thing or a bad thing in Scotland. Um, but in terms of the big suburban audiences, which were the biggest audiences by a mile, um, you know, we were you know you're talking about hundreds of people coming to to each screening the questions were all about um sustainability um you know inv- big the big environmental impacts of industries the this big fundamental question which is the, di- the there is a there is a difference between wild things and wild animals and engineered solutions that look like wild things and wild animals and that is perhaps where i, I had an interest in in hatcheries um, as a concept that whether you're f- for or against hatcheries and there are lots of different forms of hatcheries so it's very important to make that clear that it, it's not as simple as really being for or against hatcheries it's for or against a certain type of hatchery but that in any case that anything that was grown in a shed and put in a river is not a wild fish um, in my view and there are people who would and who have loudly disagreed with that that position but in my view it's not a wild fish and it's not a wild thing and um you know the risk that that represents um you know empty rivers just filling them with fi- you know fishing them filling them with hatchery reared fish that's not a wild ecosystem that it's something else no there's no you're breaking the cycle it's something the natural cycle well yeah. it, 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 it's something else so that the fundamental question was you know do we how do we value wild do we value wild is you know are our attempts to engineer solutions to mitigate the impacts of industry for example is that you know is that acceptable is it you know the attempts to re-engineer wild wild things and wilderness is that is that a good thing or is it a bad thing and you know i have my own particular view on that which it, you know changes um or, or evolves as time goes by and you learn you learn more and, and listen to people's other people the way other people think about it but that um yeah we we, we carried that film all around europe um uh, and into into london um, and had lots and lots of really interesting discussions the vast majority of them were spent on time talking about um farmed atlantic salmon as a product um that's available in supermarkets and should i be eating it how do i take action was that the main concern would you say yeah oh like yeah by, by for, an absolute country so it was mile. a consumer concern it was a consumer concern around farmed atlantic salmon should i be eating it given the environmental impacts of the the business model which is open cage you know open cage salmon farming should i be eating it if i'm not going to eat it what are the alternatives and then often it was bigger discussions around sustainability what does sustainability mean um and questioning you know because the, the temptation it, often the kind of sort of the sort of sacred cow in this was that i have to be eating an oily fish five times a week okay and and it was you know so if i'm not eating salmon then what, what should i be eating, eating? Yeah, and, okay. and often the, que- the, the the conversation went well i can't eat tuna he, here's 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 some alternatives but actually you might want to go and think about well do i need to be and should i be eating an oily fish five times a week is that sustainable consumption i don't eat oily fish five times a week well i know but lots of people do and lots yeah. of people want to and lots of people eat salmon on the base on that basis mm. um uh and so th- there was lots of conversations around that 
um, in the big suburban areas. Um, and it, for me, that was it was it was a fascinating few months doing that, um, and really forced me to think deeply about a lot of stuff and being exposed to a completely different demographic, which is what was the entire purpose yeah. of, of 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 getting involved and getting Patagonia involved in the salmon farming campaign. It was a huge success from that point of view. Um, and I, it was enormously, um, filled me with an, an enormous amount of positivity to the extent that, like them or loathe them, there is an army of 20-year-olds coming who are environmentally aware, consumer conscious, interested in animal rights, it not are very sceptical about everything they're told by supermarkets and food labelling schemes and things and like question. that. And they're questioning everything. And you, you can, if you want to call them snowflakes, fine. But there is an army, I mean an army of people coming who are um, who are going to question everything around that. And I think that filled me with huge positivity in the sense that the salmon farming debate, I, the salmon farming debate, and for me, the success in the salmon farming debate is just getting as many people to take their first step on the journey as possible. Because there's not one person that I've met in this, and I've met hundreds, if not thousands, over the last few years and talk, talking about salmon farming. There isn't one who's who started on the journey, which is, and the journey starts with, holy crap, salmon is made that way. Wow, that's incredible. I didn't understand that. That's really bad. Who's gone away and then looked at more details and done a bit of research. Who's then come back, you know, months later and said, wait a minute, you're talking rubbish. <laughs> you're this full is, of shit, Corin. <laughs> this, this is fine. What are you talking about? Yeah. Not one person has, 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 has done that. And that fills me with, it makes me hugely positive to the extent that success is simply getting as many people through the door and introducing them to the issue as possible because there's a real appetite to go and find their own information themselves, make up their own minds. And the, the reality is is that everyone arrives at the same conclusion as far as salmon farming is concerned. So long term, I don't, and we see it anyway in, in, in terms of the data that's produced by supermarkets. People under thirty and particularly under twenty five, they're just not buying they're not they're not buying seafood and they're not buying farm salmon. So job done on that front. But the, the conversations changed dramatically when um I took the film into um small, much smaller communities in Scotland. And I did that because I obviously have a very particular view about salmon farming and I think it's a bad thing. But I also recognise that salmon farming is an employer in local communities. Yeah, yeah. Um and it's a very um it's a it's a very heated topic of discussion in in rural coastal communities in Scotland, and ultimately, that if you're going to stick your head above the parapet as I have and, and chosen to do over the last couple of years on the issue, um, you have to have the courage of your convictions and get out and and get into the difficult places where the discussions are going to be difficult, where people are going to say to you, "What am I going to do for a job when?" salmon farming's gone and how which is absolutely fair to ask because it's very easy to make broad sweeping sweeping statements when it doesn't directly affect your ability to eat tomorrow well i, I actually i actually think i i've always believed that the, the argument has to be made it, to have any credibility about virtually any position you have to be making the argument face to face and if you're not prepared to make the argument face to face and you just want to be an internet warrior then i, I don't think you have a lot of credibility um, so, you know, I, I hold myself to that standard that, you know, I am talking about and what I'm advocating for on open cage salmon farming is undoubtedly going to affect um, um, people who are employed in the industry. And so I wanted to carry the film into those places where salmon farming is a significant employer. And I wanted to have those discussions um, because ultimately I think it makes it it, it, it helps me. It helps me run a better campaign um, and it helps me it helps me run a better camp and a much more realistic and a campaign that has a you know much greater chance of success if you do listen you genuinely listen to those concerns and you know what are people really concerned about so uh yeah so we i carried the film into places like Ullapool and Fort William um, what was that like uh, hectic it's yeah. just, you know it, 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 because there must have been people who were employed in the salmon farming industry there there were yeah although i have to say the the salmon farming industry um i I don't know this for sure, but um, I heard it anecdotally from 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 people. They were, people were actively discouraged from going, from going. to the, going to the events. Really, um, but we did have um, because the salmon farming industry, without getting into too much detail, they are uh, you know these are big global you know multinational global corporations that run the salmon farming industry in Scotland. There's only about five of them really who run the entire thing. 
and they want to exert a lot of control over the narrative. And the last thing they need is a bunch of young lads running around at meetings, kind of shouting and mouthing holler- off, yeah, shouting yeah. and hollering about stuff um, that the salmon farmers would much rather, you know, paint a, a, another, you know, would much rather control the narrative and have said exactly what they want said. So, um, but having said that, there was virtually every single screening we did anywhere, whether it was in Europe or here, there was someone from the salmon farming industry there. And, you know, they were good. Some of them were, you know, some of them were a bit of an echo chamber when you went further north that it was people who were already convinced that salmon farming was a bad thing. Um, And there were also some salmon farmers there who made their case, um, both in terms of the bigger issues, but also talking about, you know, the, the role they play in the local community and some of the stuff they do as well. So for me, that it was hugely, it was a hugely important process to go through. Just, you know, I felt to give credibility to, to what I was doing in the campaign I'm running, but also to understand a lot more about, you know, the place that salmon farming has in local communities and, and what, the, the, what the future needs to look like in order to have any chance of, of talking about having a, you know, a transformational transition away from, from open cage salmon farming in these places. Um, it's not you. You can't simply advocate, although that has been the case today. You can't simply advocate for just getting rid of it. Yeah. Um, there has so to be. In in your mind, it, it, it's a transformation of the industry rather than the removal of it. Not necessarily. Yeah. No, um, I don't. I mean, open cage salmon farming. I, I've often described it um, when I'm asked the question. You know, what can you do to make it better? Is you know. A cigarette is a cigarette. You're never going to change the nature of a cigarette. You can stick a filter tip on it, but it's still a cigarette. There's still, You're never going to stop it being unhealthy. And open cage salmon farming, as long as it's an open cage and that business model um, persists, there's very little, you know, you can fiddle around the edges. Mm. What um, I meant was like a complete transformation, like closed containment. Well, yeah, but that you, you, there is not necessarily, that that, that change in terms of salmon being produced either in open cages or closed containment, that is not going to be an iterative process by which open cage transitions to closed containment. It's not going to happen like that. Um, It is going to be one or the other. Um, And there's a whole variety of different reasons for that. One of the big obvious reasons is that the the investment to date in closed containment has been the capital that's invested that, that's been invested around the world, which is now significant. You know, you're talking well over a billion dollars in the last year invested in closed containment. Um, that's capital which is virtually entirely separate from the the seafood corporations that are running open cage salmon farms in Scotland. So there's a the, it, you're not you're not seeing you know big open cage salmon farmers investing in closed containment because the industries are are essentially completely distinct. And there's a there's a kind of there's a. Uh, a strategic reason for that as well, and, and I, I've kind of describe it as closed containment is a is an engineering challenge with a biological component, whereas open cage salmon farming is a biological challenge with an engineering component. So, in terms of the kind of core competencies of of each sector, they're they're almost a mirror image. So salmon farmers in open cage are really struggling, you know, a lot of the time because of the free flowing nature of the relationship between the, the the cages and the environment that surround them. Their challenge is to keep their fish healthy and to keep the water quality good. And so it's it's all about biology, uh, and the the engineering challenge in salmon farming, although it's large scale, is pretty basic. It's a floating platform with a net underneath yeah. it. That is it. Yeah. Um, whereas closed containment. You potentially you're doing away with a lot of the biological challenges because you're entirely separate from the environment. But it's the engineering challenge that's the problem. One, firstly, in terms of having being able to do it at scale, then being able to do it with you know enough redundancy in the in the uh, the engineering so that you don't have catastrophic failures, where you know you lose you know either it works or you lose your entire stock in a, yeah. in a tank in one go. So the you know the two are separate, and I, I don't really see. You know, a, a close. So it's, con- not, it's not as simple uh, as okay. Well, let's shut this fish farm down and just move it onto the shore there. No, close containment. It, it, it's because not. That's sometimes a perception. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it, it, maybe it, even guiltily, but I thought that that might no, be the case. It, it's not, and that's what presents really. That's really what presents the big challenge about transitioning the a, a transition away from open cage salmon farming is that it's not in the northwest in the northwest Highlands. It's not going to be replaced by close containment, and that's the reality. Um, because you know why? If you can grow fish in a shed, um, why would you do it 
uh, in just about one of the most difficult places to reach on the UK <laughs> mainland, yeah. as opposed to doing it just outside Hounslow, mm-hmm. where you where know, you could go straight onto a ship, and you could chuck it on a plane, or yeah. it's you know it's in the centre of London. Yeah. Um, And I think that raises even bigger questions, which I probably won't go into just now, which is why on earth go to the bother of doing it in the first place. So that's the the big challenge. And I think for for the people, everyone involved in campaigning around salmon farming and what, you know, from my point of view, the the campaign um, that I'm running is beginning to think about, well, how do you, it's a much bigger question. And is it appropriate for campaigns to be thinking about these things? But what does, what do, what do sustainable rural coastal economies look like after open cage salmon farming it's an important question though because conservation and environmental responsibility must include people as well Uh, we can be very guilty of just viewing them as uh, the animals that live there in the environment itself well i mean without (laughs) without remembering that people live in those places well there's two exactly there's two aspects to that one is the, the, the practical aspect in terms of actually making progress with the campaign you know as much as i am cynical about politicians and the political process that is ultimately going to be the the avenue for um you know long term change and uh, long term change in terms of the economies in in remote rural coastal communities and if you're walking into the minister's office and saying, "Oi, just get rid of open cage salmon farming. It's rubbish." <laughs> you're not you're not going to get anywhere. You, but would you, the only thing that'll work. No, well, <laughs> it, no, it, it's not. So you have to you, you have to provide alternatives, which means bizarrely, you know, you end up in my position running a, a salmon farming campaign where you're spending a lot of time thinking about sustainable economies in the northwest of Scotland, which is um, uh, you know, a development challenge that the Scottish government spends a lot of its time thinking about. And, and I, my view, you know, is certainly I am not, a, you know, an environmental fundamentalist as much as, um, you know, the salmon farming would like to, you know, likes to, um, <laughs> likes to believe that, I am, yeah. <laughs> is that, you know, I, my my real kind of passion is about having genuine, sustainable rural economies with local enfranchisement, um, you know, where the benefits that that are produced, the benefits that are, that can be produced from our environmental assets and, and rural places are are enjoyed and the surpluses that can be created by that are enjoyed by those communities and that we can build economies that are genuinely sustainable over a long period of time. And that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean doing less. That means doing a lot more. It just means thinking more intelligently about it than just having a giant mega corporation coming along and saying, I need a bit of space in order to have a big pen here so I can chuck some feed in, feed a fish, um, and I need somewhere where all the crap can go, um, uh, and I'll I'll employ a few people. That that you know, it, it's a big it's a big cumbersome simple solution that has been shown or is being shown to to probably is not, despite the fact that it employs some people, is probably overall not providing a net benefit to Scotland. It, it, once you account for environmental damage and all that kind of stuff. And it, so, what does the transition look like? Well, you know, transition away from open cage. The big, the first big question is scale, which is why do we? You know, the industry is expanding at the moment. Salmon farming is expanding, but it's in, it's expanding in terms of intensity, not surface area. Which means, you know, so you, they're putting more biomass in. into into the into an existing farm. Which means you have farms like the small, you know, locally owned companies in salmon farming companies in Scotland, like say Loch Duart and Wester Ross. They have small salmon farms, like you know, salmon farms that are three hundred tons or five hundred tons, and they're trying to make them bigger. But you know, you look at the big, the real big kind of global seafood corporations, and they have, you know, I think there's a, there's a salmon farm which is just about to go up to seven and a half thousand tons, one farm. Um, and I know, you know, I've seen, uh, I've found through freedom of information investigations, you know, the Scottish Environmental Agency has modelled salmon farms all the way up to 11,000 tonnes. And in Norway, that's not unusual. You know, the farms are much, much bigger in Norway. But the question is, uh, at scale, how is that scale, how is that increasing scale of benefit to Scotland? Because a 500 tonne farm might employ four or five people. But a set, you know, a 5,000 tonne farm, it doesn't employ 40 or 50 people, it employs maybe six or seven so you're, you, you've got 10 times the environmental footprint for one or two extra jobs. And the question is, well, that extra scale, who's that benefiting? Uh, you know, so you've got, a ma- you've got a much, much bigger environmental footprint for, you know, one or two extra jobs. And who's that benefiting? Because Scotland doesn't benefit. It, it, there's no real, there are direct levies on a weight basis on, on salmon in Scotland. 
but the levy is so small that the amount of money that's that's raised is meaningless. So the expansion of a salmon farm like that, the, the actual the benefit that Scotland derives of that that additional you know seven thousand tons of of, of farm salmon over and above a five hundred ton farm. It's difficult. I don't. I don't understand, and I've not seen anyone make the case for that for Scotland. So, you could quite simply, you know, you could ha- you could have a lot smaller, a whole load of much smaller salmon farms, which employ the employ same the number same of people, people. Mm. with a um, much with a much lower level of impact. with a much lower of, of environmental impact. That said, those small farms have still the smaller farms have still been shown to have you know they still have very very considerable environmental impacts. When you consider, you know, the potential that they have to produce sea lice and the impact that that has on wild fish, um, and, so, and we haven't even talked about the animal welfare aspect of fish no. within these farms yet. No, but it, so there, covered there, before, but. there's questions around scale, which is why do we need these giant mega farms? And you know, it, it, the the numbers are just getting absolutely astronomical, and you, we're not seeing any benefits. If you reduce that environmental footprint, um, you know, potentially that allows other industries to. Um, to regain regain some of the ground they've lost. So we 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 we've seen you know examples like it, the, from the recreational kind of fishing point of view, somewhere like Loch Marie. I mean, Loch Marie is a brilliant case study, and it may it may prove to be you know. Are they def- not? Are they removing that farm now? They have committed publicly to removing it. I thought I'd seen something. Um, yeah, and and so it's going to be an interesting. I mean, that's been one of the big successes of the last year. Basically, is forcing a global seafood giant to close a salmon farm. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's never been done before. That's a first. That's a first. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, uh, and you know, everyone involved deserves a lot of credit for that. And the local fishery board did an extraordinary amount um, to make that happen. Um, salmon and trout conservation have been lobbying hard for that for a long time. My own campaign, you know, well, that was how we. That's how I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the first place, yeah. My, uh, my own campaign played a small role in that as well. Um, and you know, there's been no end of um, local um, NGOs who, you know, on other issues, have made sure that that farm had had no future by closing down by closing down um, avenues for for kind of prevarication and things. Um, but Loch is a really interesting example from an economic point of view because, and you, you, in, in this, you will have to accept causality, which the industry won't, which I think is just is ridiculous. But if you accept causality, which is that there was obviously a well-established, long-standing recreational fishery there, which employed, you know, um, probably half a dozen full-time gillies and about twenty seasonal gillies across all the different estates and on via the hotel and things. And then the hotel was booked, you know, solidly throughout the season. So you had all the hotel staff that were employed, again, full-time equivalents and seasonal staff and then supply chain. So by my rough estimations, you're talking about that rec- that single recreational fishery, the sea trout fishery at Loch Marie, probably was sustaining somewhere in the region of oh, maybe 100, 100 plus jobs um, across, the, across the local area and a little bit into the supply chain. Along came the salmon farm. Um, and opened up, and the sea trout run disappeared. It, it it decimated the sea trout run. And this was this was a world renowned sea trout run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was world renowned, and, and the, you know the fishery was full. The recreational fishery was full in terms of it was sold out every year. It was dead man's shoes, so it was running at full economic capacity. Um, the salmon farm came along and essentially wiped out that fishery and wiped out and has wiped out those jobs. They no, those jobs no longer exist. But the salmon farm brought four jobs with it. You know, if the, if those jobs had been genuinely incremental jobs which are added to the area with no with no other impacts then fine but it's clearly not been the case and in terms of you know understanding what is what is the benefit of salmon farming to scotland um, at the moment the scottish government basically says all right well what is the value of the salmon that is sold from that farm and that the value from that farm would probably be you know somewhere in a good production cycle you're talking about that farm selling maybe 15 million quids worth of salmon that is that's the number that the scottish government essentially used to assess the value of the farm to scotland oh well we're adding 15 million quid to gdp job done but clearly that is a idiotic way to assess the value of it because the question you have to ask is, of that £15 million, how much is retained in Scotland, how much is retained regionally, um, the region the farm exists, and how much is retained locally? Now, when you actually start to do that, what you find is that of the £15 million that's generated, only between 150 and 200000 is retained directly locally in the form of salaries. The other 95% disappears off into the supply chain and a substantial amount of that is, I mean, a very substantial amount of that, over half, 
in, is used up in terms of feed cost, in terms of leasing big heavy well boats and that kind of stuff. All of that is revenue which you know eventually disappears. It goes somewhere out, out of Scotland, um, and you know so you could say the val- the value of the salmon farm to the local community was the the hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The two hundred thousand slightly pounds different number to fifteen in, million in salaries, yeah. yeah. But then, of course, you have to net that off against the 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 um, the revenue or the the economic benefit that's been lost as a result of the the sea trout fishery disappearing, where you've lost, you know, probably, you know, you're you're talking about lo- local jobs. You know, let's say I can't remember when I did the figures, but you're looking at I would say that sea trout fishery had a full time equivalent across the lo- that local area of somewhere between 10 and 20 full-time equivalent jobs and then seasonal probably double that again uh, maybe double or treble that again and and that's the point when you're looking at these industries and what does that what what should things look like in the future is you could lose that salmon farm at Loch U, and we're going to and we'll lose those four or five jobs which is a really really bad outcome for the people who are employed on those farms there's no doubt about that but if if the result of that is that you know twenty local jobs emerge in the in the recovery of Loch Marie in a sustainable local recreational fishery, well then clearly it's better for the local community, and and more than that, that in terms of genuinely sustainable um, economies, that that all of the benefits, virtually all of the benefits it's that are derived from that, stay locally. Now that obviously there are issues of land ownership, which are which are controversial, but the reality is, and you know this plays into some of the issues around. I think the the narrative that that grouse shooting has got wrong is that actually in terms of the the share of benefits um, f- that are that would that would accrue from uh, the Loch Marie recreational fishery, those share of benefits, the vast majority would be retained in the local area by local people. Whereas from salmon farming, you're talking about 15 million quid being generated and 150 grand being retained <laughs> in the local area. So the share of benefits is grossly unfair when you consider that the environmental impact of that farm is borne by the local community. So simply on, if you if you were just to say, the space that the farm takes up, that's somewhere that the local creel fishermen are not able to put down their creels, notwithstanding the fact that the, the impact of those farms is you know, potentially much further out. You're talking miles and miles and miles. If that farm is running acoustic deterrent devices to scare away seals, and which, not, which has an impact on dolphins and um, other cetaceans and things like that, when the farm disappears, you know, there'll, be, there'll be more wildlife in the local area. Perhaps that allows you know, ecotourism businesses to consider kind of springing up. Um, uh, and so you, you can see the farm disappears. You've got a much smaller top line number in terms of what the the um, you know the, the the recreational fishery at Loch Marie, if it recovers, it's only going to generate at you know at best maybe maybe a million quid a year top line. So two million quid as a, as opposed to fifteen million based on the but two year production cycle. But yeah, in the case of the farm, two hundred thousand is retained in the local area. But of the million pounds or the two million pounds which is generated top line. You're probably retaining at least half, you know, five hundred thousand. So you're beating the salmon farm in terms of sustainable, sustainable livelihoods and um, money in the local area. And but then, then you've got the. I mean, you, it's a very difficult thing to do. But the environmental. I mean, we're we're doing it in ter- uh, in terms of uh, looking at the economics of of jobs lost. But you also got the environmental costs, which is a much more difficult thing to actually put a monetary value on. I mean, we're doing you're doing it in a, in a way here by looking at job loss, but there's a greater environmental cost, which you know hasn't even really featured in this discussion. We've just been looking at jobs for people. Well, well exactly. I mean, that all forms it, that should all form part of the process of a of, of evaluating a, whether of something a, should go ahead of or a not. competent, rigorous process of evaluating the net benefit of. An activity, uh, you know, in the case of salmon farming, a big industrial activity which is ultimately owned by an offshore interest a long, long, long way away. That would all form part of assessing the value, the net value of that of that industry to Scotland. And you know, so that is look at the gross benefits, but then you have to offset opportunity cost. You know, costs associated with regulating the industry. It, it doesn't come for free. You have to regulate the thing, and that costs a lot. Diminution of natural capital. You know, we have to place an economic value on that to do the calculation. But the reduction in biodiversity, so the reduction in lobster and shrimp and and wild fish, um, that results from having a salmon farming an open cage salmon farm around. W- what is that worth? You know, we're, we don't do the, that work to understand that. And obviously, it is worth more than money itself. Yeah. I'm not advocating for 
just placing a value and exploiting it in terms of um, being able to do it on a um, you know an economic basis. We need to consider that stuff. So I, I think when you consider what does the future look like, you know my absolute belief is that we can develop diverse, which is really important, diversified economies in the northwest coast of Scotland, small ones, but still all they have to beat is the is the net benefit that salmon farms would provide, which is a small number, small, sustainable, diversified rural economies where the surpluses from um, those enterprises are retained locally. And that's one of the biggest, my biggest gripes about salmon farming is is the you know the economic surplus that's been generated, um, and I'll I'll come back to that. Diversified local businesses that children who are the, my daughter, for example, you know I can say to her, you know you, you can go and live and work. You know there is a future for you if you want to live and work up near Ullapool or 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 Gearlock or places like that. There's a there's a good job up there, and uh, uh, you know there's a there's a good job for you, and because it, it's a fantastic place to live, you know there's a good long uh, sustainable future for you up there, which doesn't involve completely trashing the environment. And uh, just to come back on this issue of of kind of surplus, and and the one of the things that really frustrates me is this narrative around. Um, that salmon farming has saved desperate rural communities up and down the northwest coast Which of Scotland. Which we see all the time as yeah. an argument, yeah. Uh, and it, it, it is, it, it, I think it's, gro- it's grossly patronising for, for a start. I don't think there's any real evidence to support it. But here's a, you know, here's something which I, I think is kind of, kind of says it all really. You know, over the last 20 years in the northwest coast of, of Scotland, the salmon farms from that region have sold something in the region of you know, somewhere in the region of ten to fifteen billion pounds worth of farmed salmon, um, on to, based on to de- using today's values, and obviously, um, you know, in the past the sales have been less, but you know, because of inflation and all that jazz. But um, essentially, the the industry has generated somewhere between ten and fifteen billion pounds worth of value from those areas. Drive up and down the west coast of Scotland and show me any sign that there has been a salmon farming boom. That there's no, there's an absolutely no sign of it whatsoever. There's there's no, um, there's no deviation from a uh, trend on house prices. There's been no, the house prices are not worth more. Uh, you know they've they've not risen at a faster rate. All of the things which we've seen in Aberdeen with you know with an oil with when 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 oil was booming, you know you're not seeing guys driving around in Range Rovers. You're not <laughs> seeing big houses being built. Yeah. There are no visible signs of there ever having been a salmon farming boom, and if salmon farming finished tomorrow, there would be no, there'd be legacy, no legacy for there'd it. There'd be no legacy mm-hmm. for it, and that in itself is case in point as to why salmon farming has contributed nothing to those communities other than, at best, um, cannibalising jobs that were there already and offering nothing more than than subsistence for those local communities. The surpluses that have been generated by salmon farming have disappeared. They've disappeared, certainly disappeared out the local area. There's virtually no sign of them being um, existing in the region. They've perhaps gone, some of the surpluses have gone into the central belt or elsewhere in Scotland. But the reality is that the vast majority, because of the concentrated ownership structure, um, um, where salmon farming, 99.9% of it is owned by global global sea, seafood companies based in Norway and Canada, the benefits have all gone there. They've 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 not they've not been retained in in local communities. But what has been retained in local communities is twenty or thirty years worth of salmon farm crap, <laughs> um, <laughs> pollution uh, and environmental degradation, pollution, disease, um, uh, parasites, and environmental degradation. Yeah, that's and that's been the deal. And to my mind, in the simplest terms, that has been a terrible deal for the northwest coast of Scotland. Um, and so to beat that in the future, I don't think is particularly challenging. You wouldn't think so. <laughs> uh, as a way to kind of uh, wrap this up, there there has been sort of progress in terms of you know meetings and committee meetings and groups of people discussing this in Parliament, which I know you've been involved in. What's the the state of play in the Scottish government in terms of that right now? You know what what is their their view on it, or, or what have these reports said about salmon farming as a way to uh, or as a, as a base? to move forward on into the future? Um, so when I spoke to you last year, um, we were just getting to the end of the second parliamentary inquiry, or the second inquiry in the Scottish Parliament in that year into the environmental impacts of salmon farming. Those inquiries were led by two independent cross-party committees, um, the Eclair Committee and the Rural Economy Committee. Two separate committees, 
both arrived um, at the conclusion that salmon farming is an environmentally damaging industry, of that there is no doubt whatsoever, and that the regulatory framework um, in Scotland is entirely dysfunctional and uh, inappropriate. Um, for an industry of that scale, the second committee reported in November last year, and some of the they, they produced seven, uh, sorry, sixty five recommendations, but the the uh, the recommendations um, came alongside commentary with quotes along quotes such as, um, if the current salmon farming issues um, are not addressed, expansion will be unsustainable and may cause irrecoverable damage. Um, the development and growth of the salmon farming sector is taking place without full understanding of the environmental impacts. The salmon farming industry growth targets do not take into account the capacity of the environment to farm that quantity of salmon. Provision of sea lice data should in future be mandatory for all salmon farms in Scotland. So the, the committees were damning, both about the Scottish Government and about um, open cage salmon farming as a, as a business model um, and its impacts on the environment. These committees is what, are what, or these reports are what the government used to advise future regulation and legislation? Well, that's, it basically, it, it's basically telling the Scottish Government that... Do they have to listen to it? These are our findings um, and this is what you should be doing. And they produced 65, the, the, the Rural Economy um, Committee produced 65 recommendations and it, essentially the, it's then up to the government um, what do you want to do about that? Do you want to take those recommendations forward and do something about it or don't you? And since last November, uh, we have had absolutely no progress whatsoever. The only thing that's progressed since last November is that the industry has expanded by approximately about 25%. Whoa, 25%? Um, yeah, that by some measures in terms of the fish in water. So yeah, the, so the, by the, the biomass. Of yeah, the, the biomass of, of fish in the water. Wow. Um, the Scottish government today, as we, as we stand in, in November 2019, it's done nothing. There, there has been no primary legislation brought forward. Um, there has been... Um, at best, some very, very minor tinkering with some voluntary guidelines. Um, and what we have had from the, the Scottish Government is essentially a statement recently that um, we need to look at some more stuff. We're going to try and do some things by the end of 2020. Um, then we're going to put it out to public consultation. Um, and then um, we'll see what we might bring forward. And the stuff that they're looking at is they're talking about... Um, you know the the mandatory reporting of sea lice. They're not talking about making any fundamental changes around the uh, the emission of waste, organic waste from salmon farms, um, being dumped into the environment. Which was one of the recommendations of the committees, which said you have to look at as a matter of urgency the collection and disposal of waste from salmon farms. So they're not looking at anything that would be transformational in terms of the operation of the industry. And so essentially, they're just kicking it into the long grass. These reports now exist, and those recommendations are very clearly there. I mean, there's some sitting on your computer right there. How, how do you make the government listen a little bit more um, clearly? Well, then we, you know, we get into the dirty world of politics. And, and essentially, uh, you know, I, I refer to the work I do as a salmon farm campaign, and that's what it is. It's a campaign. It is a, it's a it's a, uh, a a movement that has all the the properties of a political campaign, and and in order to get the Scottish government to do anything, um, logic will get you so far, but to seal the deal is going to come down to having um, a mandate and having um, and having poli you know significant political capital, which means having broad public support for for the issue and for change. And I genuinely believe that in the run up to the Scottish election, which is in, in May 2021, sorry, May or March, I can't remember, salmon farming as an issue, open cage salmon farming as a as an environmental issue in Scotland is this is the biggest environmental issue in Scotland today. It is by the admission of the um, the industry itself, it is the biggest environmental polluter in Scotland as an industry. My small little Facebook page, which I only spend about eight hours a week on, recently in the last um, in the last couple of weeks, I, I track engagement with the page. So the numbers of people engaging with the content um, and engagement can be either commenting or sharing or liking or anything like that. I track the page and compare it to the political parties in Scotland to just to get a sense of well where where is the issue. Bear in mind that my page is probably the only it's the only page um, um, significant kind of page on the issue in Scotland. Where is it in the landscape? And in the week that the general election was announced, the page a page about salmon farming had more engagement than three out of the five major political parties. The only two political parties with more engagement on their Facebook and their social media were was the SNP, obviously, because it's enormous, 
um, by orders of magnitude. And then the Scottish government, the Scottish Conservatives, just just um, beat me on engagement. But Scottish Labour, Liberal Democrats, and the Greens um, all had less engagement um, across their issues during a general election week. And that, coupled with you know getting out there and talking to people in um, you know uh, at film screenings and at other events. Um, and also an in interest from the press and the broadcast media, it absolutely convinces me that this is the it, there is an appetite for this issue um, which goes beyond simply small vested interest groups. It's a big, big question which is complicated and cuts across a lot of areas to do with economics, um, exploitation of Scotland's natural assets, um, land ownership, you know, community engagement and enfranchisement, um, you know, sustainable economies for the northwest. It, it cuts, uh, you know, and the whole environmental side and climate change side and, and you know, the environmental degradation associated with the industry. It cuts across all of those issues, um, which is why, you know, virtually everyone who, who starts on the journey with salmon farming finds something in the discussion and the debates that is incredibly motivating and engaging. Um, it's It's not a simple and small topic. Well, hopefully when we record again in November 2020, you'll be able to tell me that the, the government's done something <laughs> and, that, and that we're moving forward and not backward by putting more salmon in uh, salmon farms. I think we will. We will. I think the reality is, I, I actually don't think that the Scottish government is going to do very much uh, ever. I, I don't think they can. I don't think they have the room to manoeuvre because the industry is going to be pressured, uh, is going to have existential pressure um, from the point of view of the expansion of closed containment salmon and what that's going to do to um, the economics of the industry in terms of potentially driving down the, 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 the price that they can sell salmon for. And so will open cage be economically viable in the future is a big question. Um, that is a, a significant question. And then secondly, you know, is the, is the question of demand. You know, the, the, the sales of farm salmon in the UK are falling and falling fast. You know, the farm salmon sales... Um, are falling in supermarkets. As I said, the um, anecdotal information would suggest that you know under 25s are not going anywhere near seafood, let alone farmed salmon, uh, and that's borne out in you know the hard data that's produced by organisations like Nielsen and HomeScan uh, and their HomeScan reports and um, uh, and and stuff like that. So I, I think you know uh, the demographic that is buying farmed salmon is you know 45 plus you know married couples with no kids at home. Um, and I think more and more is going to emerge on the consumer side that 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 that's going to take the um, going to take the edge off salmon. So I think that's probably where we will see the main pressures coming from. Because frankly, I, I you know the Scottish government doing anything is just going to add cost to the industry, and it the industry will make that point over and over again. And it's going to be difficult to see how the Scottish government can do anything. So I, I don't know. We, I don't know how things are going to pan out, but it certainly, I think the future looks very, very bleak for open cage, um, uh, for open cage salmon farming. Um, I just hope that we can hold back the tide enough as we are. We're, you know, we're stopping expansion. The, the Scottish government had um, uh, set a target of producing 210,000 tonnes of salmon by 2020, and they're not, they're not going to produce, they're going to miss that target. Um, I would guess next year they will end up producing something in the region the, the industry will produce something in the region. They will probably fiddle the figures, but I, I don't think they'll get through 200,000. This year, we've had enormous mortality um, across the industry, unprecedented mortality across the industry. Um, and that's at rates which are, you know, stocking rates which are less than what would provide 200,000 tonnes a year. So I don't think they're going to get there. So I'm positive um, about that and that we're holding back expansion as best we can. I just hope that um, when it's done and when it's gone, that we have that the environment can recover and that we will see wild fish stocks recover. Um, but I, I, I remain pretty positive about that. If people want to follow your work, where's the what's the name of the Facebook page? Um, so the the Facebook page is called Inside Scottish Salmon Feedlots, um, and it's just I, basically I, I run other social media, but it, it, Facebook's a great medium because it, it can carry a lot of information. Instagram and Twitter not so much. Um, so uh, yeah, most of the content. That's, that's the best place to. That's go, the best go place to go and look. Stuff. Yeah, it, and um, there's a mountain of stuff on there um, covering all sorts of st every kind of sort of different area, whether it's regulatory or political or environmental or consumer side of things. There's just tons and tons of content on there, and that's just going to keep coming. You know, it's going to keep coming. There's lots of demand um, from 
food and lifestyle journalists um, who are wanting to write about this topic. Um, I, you know, I get emails every single week about about this kind of stuff now um, from a, a whole army of different people. So it's going to move up and up and up the agenda, I think. And of course, we're seeing in Canada, you know, in, in Canada, we saw that um, Justin Trudeau, as a core general election pledge last month, um, a, a central election pledge was that he was going to remove open cage salmon farms from the sea by 2025 in Canada. I, I missed that. I didn't um, see that announcement. You know, okay. so you know that that. So was, they're obviously very very aware of the issues that are around. Yeah, yeah. It's the same companies, same problems. Um, it's the same issues. Um, but you know, so he made whether it'll happen, I don't know. But it was a grand political gesture, which shows you that the issue it's is important on it, a political it's, landscape. It's important enough to be to be a central um, election pledge. You know, we've seen Denmark commit to um, ending the expansion of open cage um, salmon farms in Denmark. Small industry, but still significant. Norway, for you know, for all its fault and the spawn of this industry, they are investing considerable amounts in um, incentivizing the industry to move into closed containment. They see that being the future. You know, they were look, they're looking at, you know, they were looking at examining a, a 40% tax on the open cage salmon farmers because of the the um the nature of the environmental degradation and you know and degrading a public asset uh, and you know part of that I assume is just to create an incentive to to move on land so I, I think open cage is is it, it, long term I think it's a dead man walking but as I say I just I just hope that not too much damage has been done in the meantime yeah um and I, you know I think we need to be aware of the things that are you know where the risks lie in terms of salmon farming. And you know, one of my kind of bugbears is that um, the the government continuously says, "Oh, we need more data. We need more data. We need more science." And that is, you know, that was used as a um, you know as a tool to allow the tobacco industry to keep operating. At, you know, at the extent that it was for a long time. Um, and I, I think it's a culture. Same as leaded fuel. Yeah, it, it's a culture that needs to change. Where you know, big environment, big industrial polluters need to demonstrate safety rather than placing a, a, the onus on civil society and people like me and small organizations that simply don't have the resources to ever produce those the levels of stu- you know the types of studies that governments would would um would meet a threshold that governments could use to produce legislation you, you know you, you can't expect civil society to fill that gap you, it should be on the industry that's to, where the burden should lie yeah should, the, the industry should have to demonstrate safety and we need to be very careful that the science that organizations that are doing science whether it's fishery boards or whatever it is they need to be very careful um that they are not essentially enabling the expansion of the industry and uh, by simply you know allowing governments to filibuster and um, and call for more you know wait for more science to be delivered um you know it, it's pretty clear to me that 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 science in inverted commas has actually over the last 10 or 15 years been weaponized by industry and government in order to serve, you know, exactly that purpose to delay and confuse, because um, we haven't been able to get the answers we need. We, we'll never be able to get the answers we need from science. Science will never provide the answers. You know, all you will end up doing is just chasing, um, uh, you know, increasing granularity. So if we do, you know, the most detailed um, tracking projects and most innovative tracking projects we've ever done, where we follow, you know, the juvenile farm salmon all the way to the feeding grounds, and then the, the salmon are disappearing and dying there. Right. Well, fine. We've got this what next what we're then going to have to research well what's happening on the feeding grounds what you know what what's happening to the you know the salmon's food source uh, you will end up in a never ending sort of disappearing down the the rabbit hole just with increasing granularity because you know these things are incredibly complex um so you know i think science in inverted commas needs to be you know very specifically directed um you know, needs to have very well defined, predefined, you know, purpose and outcomes that it's seeking to inform, and um, very clear goals and targets for um, what it's going to deliver. And be and something a, that you can act on at the end uh, of the um, day. Yeah, and be and be assessed against that. And at the end of the day, it's a very very simple measure, which is: is the stuff that you're doing resulting in a greater abundance of the species? And honestly. You know, I think it's you know if you look at again science and in inverted commas over the last twenty years, the best you can say about science is it's managed a decline. It, you know, is is science going to save salmon? If there's certainly no evidence of it so far, and and that comes back to what we we spoke about right at the very beginning. 
that what is going to save salmon is making salmon really, really important to the general public and entrenching the iconic status of that species and the, the importance of salmon being abundant for um, for everyone, whether your interest is in birds, whether it's in bugs, whether it's just in you know, environmental health or whether it's in recreational fishing. But making sure that salmon is the, it is the indicator of, of the health of our rivers. It's that that is going to get the deal done. It's that that's going to provide mandate and enough political capital to ever convince the Scottish government to do anything, not endless, endless science. Um, it is not going to be the answer on its own. And I think in bringing that circle right back to the start of the podcast, I think that's a brilliant way to stop. Thank you very much for your time, Corin. And uh, yeah, we, we, will, we will podcast again in 12 months. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> always a pleasure. Um, yeah, we'll see you again in 12 months. <laughs> and that's it for another two weeks. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you'd like to contact us, it's the usual methods, which is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. You can find our website on all the W's, thepacebrothers.com. And Instagram, Pace underscore brothers. People also tweet us, and I think it's Pace Brothers as well. Underscore brothers. I think uh, it is. I should really know yeah, that. Yeah, people do tweet us now and then, so, yeah. If you want to win a copy of Modern Huntsman, don't forget to enter the competition which we gave you details for at the very start, where we want to know what our animal sound of this week is. And we will pick the winner at random from the correct entries and send a copy of Volume 3 out to you, which was all about uh, wildlife management. I think we will try and hope we can we will try and actually put out an extra show uh of just we me, always me, fail me when we want to do but that before <laughs> christmas before before uh, before christmas we'll record it in the next week or two and then we can put it out right before christmas and we can actually maybe wrap up the year and look who we've talked to and, yeah, and a little like, review of all the podcasts. review of all the podcasts and favorite moments and things like that uh we uh, i caught up with sam thompson on the phone <laughs> about a week ago and he, always a favorite with the he, listeners. Yeah, well, that, that was this is why I mentioned it because I think he's been our jan- our first podcast of the year, two years running now, <laughs> and it's always an epic conversation with him. So I'm going to try, if it makes sense, I'm going to try and make him the first podcast of 2020, and quite. then he'll be three years, three in, a years row. in a row. <laughs> he's always got plenty to say to Sam. If if you have any podcast guests or suggestions, or if you are in fact an interesting person yourself, uh, then. Get in contact with. I'm not yeah, saying that, I'm not saying you you're not you're <laughs> a boring person if you don't if you contact think us. Other people yes. will find your stories interesting. Interesting. Let us, know. let us know, and then we would love to get you on the show. Any, anyone, literally anyone. Yeah, we'll, our we'll, spectrum's pretty wide. It is pretty yeah. wide. From Corin on this podcast to Sean Conway to Levison Wood, um, Ed Stafford, Ed Stafford to all of the hunting and fishing related <laughs> stuff that we've done. You know, it's it's a big spectrum of yeah. guests in so, the great outdoors with an environmentally and ethical ethically conscious mind that's what we want yeah oh i just uh before we we uh let the good listeners go because they've been listening for over two hours now i just finished ant middleton's latest book good. in fact you listened to the end of it I yeah i did uh yeah no always good his first one was really good his books are, are a combination both of his books are a combination of like life lessons slash a story so it kind of like gives you uh, like leadership or motivational stuff halfway through a chapter and then talks about that part of the story and how he overcame whatever it is. This one is picking off basically from the last book and is him climbing Everest. Mm. And uh, what a joke that is. <laughs> There's a documentary on it as well. Isn't it? Yeah, he, he, did, he, did, he did a documentary as well. But uh, maybe one of our listeners have, has climbed Everest. Uh, yeah, if you have, I'd love uh, to hear from, hear from um, your experience and your take on it. But uh, this is about the third book I've read about Everest. Uh, and I've also watched a documentary or two documentaries on it. And every one comes out the same, which is that if you pay your money and providing you don't die, as in of exposure or and you can uh, handle and a demo the or, or something, you can handle the altitude, then you will get to the top and back. And you'll stand in a long ass queue to do it and mm. you'll lose $70,000. It doesn't sound like fun to me. No, it doesn't sound like fun to me at all. Well, my counter to that is I'm reading a book called Being Mortal, which is all about dying. <laughs> uh, but it's actually really, really good. So if you want something a little bit different, Being Mortal. There we go. Uh, And I think with that, we will leave you and you'll hear from us again in two weeks' time.